which is the tradition ahead of him giving his speeches either midterm or the February budget. They're entering in. Uh, there's a lot of heavy weight on the minister's shoulders as the nation waits to hear what he has in store in terms of dealing with the country's challenges and uh, what tools he's going to use in so doing. So Arabile, uh, that's uh, pretty much uh, where we're going to leave it for now, of course. We know that uh, there's a lot uh, riding on his decision right now. Uh, we're going to see how he's going to manage to balance the books, how he's going to reprioritize the finances and so on and so forth, how he's going to manage to bring down the debt levels. In the background, you can hear students uh, who are uh, protesting because they say they don't have enough money to be able to buy a meal for each day. They're saying that government needs to assist in this regard. The country has many challenges, as we all very know. And how on earth is the minister going to balance between ensuring that those who are vulnerable get what they need and cutting the budget where he needs to in order to ensure that we get on the right debt trajectory path? Uh, this is going to be a very interesting uh, speech and uh, we hope that he's going to be able to deliver something magnificent. We know that the markets uh, are one stakeholder that are watching very closely uh, and market analysts are saying that this is a very, very important speech because of course the ratings agencies are also watching if we're not heading in the, direct, in the right direction seemingly we could face more downgrades and of course when the country is downgraded it means it's more expensive for government and other companies, uh, private sector companies to borrow money on the bond market and of course you have to pay higher interest rates and development therefore becomes that much more expensive uh, and so we're going to leave it there Arabile so that uh, when the minister does begin to speak uh, then in, indeed uh, we'll get straight to him so it's over to you Give that medium term budget policy statement. It goes quarantining as well, uh, having been in contact with somebody who has now tested positive for COVID-19 at a recent event as well. The event, however, today is going to be of so, uh, massive significance. I know that the word has been touted that it may even be the most significant medium-term budget policy statement we've had for quite some time, but it certainly is the latest one to improve and hopefully shape the future of South Africa's economy. A downward phase where South Africa could perhaps decline by around 8% when it comes to its economic trajectory. And then where's the growth picture for next year? Where will that growth actually come from? If we're spending all this money, the ratings agencies and even the World Bank are saying you cannot then continue to have a public wage cycle that continues to increase and you also cannot ensure that SOEs keep on getting money. So it gets interesting from here on in. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now begin proceedings and we'll head off to the National Assembly where the proceedings for the medium term budget policy statement begin. We'll be with you right after this. All right, we seem to be losing the connection.
Welcome, Mr. President. Lastly, in the interest of safety for all present in the chamber, please keep your masks on and sit in your designated areas. We request members to sign the attendance slips. Thank you very much. The secretary will read the first to the fourth orders together. <clears throat> Medium term budget policy statement, introduction of the second adjustments appropriation bill of the rates and monetary amounts and amendment of revenue laws bill and of the taxation laws amendment bill. And I recognize the Honorable the Minister of Finance. Deputy Speaker of the National Assembly, uh, <coughs> President, of the, <coughs> President of the Republic of South Africa, Deputy President, uh, Cabinet colleagues, the Governor of the South African Reserve Bank, the tenth one, because <coughs> I'm the eighth one. <laughs> Members of the executive committees responsible for finance, team finance, uh, honorable members. Today we table the division of revenue second amendment bill the second adjustments appropriations bill, the 2020 rates and monetary amounts and amendment of revenue laws bill, the 2020 taxation laws amendment bill, the 2020 tax administration laws amendment bill, the 2020 second adjusted estimates of national expenditure, and finally, the 2020 medium-term budget policy statement. Honorable members, 26 years ago, President Nelson Mandela stood at this very spot to weave the tapestry of our newly democratic country. So it is quite correct when some of us say, we have stood where giants have stood before. Freedom was only two weeks old. Madiba challenged us to, and I quote, meet despair with hope and death with a reaffirmation of the beauty of life, unquote. His plan for the country's first democratic administration committed us to fiscal rehabilitation after the devastation visited upon our public finances by the apartheid regime. Most of us sitting here today in this house did not know it then, but Madiba was ushering in a period of unmatched social progress in our history. Over the next 15 years, the economy began to re-emerge from the apartheid crisis. Real GDP growth rose by 61% and 5.3 million jobs were created. We are today fiscally at a moment not too dissimilar to 1994. We must rebuild our economy, rehabilitate our public finances, and recover from the devastation visited upon us by COVID-19. As we rose 
to that fiscal challenge then, so we will rise to this one this time. Two weeks ago, President Ramaphosa, in fact, here it says, President Matamela Sira Ramaphosa laid out, I was a bit scared to mention his names, laid out the government's consensus-driven and action-oriented economic reconstruction and recovery plan. I say consensus-driven because in large part, the plan was discussed and consulted upon at NEDLAC and eventually agreed upon. This particular plan is urgent and all of us should do everything in our power to implement it. Uh, Deputy Speaker, the June 2020 Special Adjustments Budget was prepared in an environment of extreme uncertainty. Given the economic situation then, government proposed a three-year fiscal consolidation program. Since June, more data has become available. The economy now is expected to contract by 7.8% this year. And the 2021 outlook is more uncertain. Job losses have been particularly severe. But we cannot allow ourselves to fall into a season of despair, despite the challenges of the pandemic. We cannot allow ourselves to move towards a sovereign debt crisis. We have it within our power to reverse this pathway. Therefore, today, government sets out an active set of measures to avoid a sovereign debt crisis. We table a five-year fiscal consolidation pathway that promotes economic growth while bringing debt under control. The fiscal measures realign the composition of our spending from consumption towards investment and support efforts to lower the cost of capital. Our revised fiscal framework puts us on a course to stabilize the debt to GDP ratio at around 95% within the next five years. But I must emphasize that this means that going forward, the risk is on the upside. The stock of gross debt will rise from roughly 4 trillion this year to 5.5 trillion in 2023-24. May I repeat this? Our revised fiscal framework puts us on a course to stabilize the debt to GDP ratio at around 25%, 95% rather, within the next five years. Very close to 100% of GDP. So the risks are higher. Therefore, there cannot be any slippage on the fiscus. There's no room for slippage. Yes, I think you're right, yes. Thank you for that. I think you went to a better school than me. <clears throat> Thank you. The, the stock of gross debt will rise from roughly 4 trillion this year to 5.5 trillion in 23-24. The medium-term fiscal strategy narrows the main budget primary deficit from an expected 266 billion rand in 21-22 to 84 billion rand in 23-24. And we achieve a surplus by 25-26. <coughs> we propose... <laughs> the seven We propose, Deputy Speaker, consolidated spending of 
6.2 trillion over the 2021 20, 20, 20, medium term expenditure framework, of which 1.2 trillion goes to learning and culture. Here by culture, we don't mean uh, the, just art and culture. We mean education, basic education, higher education, and so on, <clears throat> including art and culture. 978 billion to social development and 724 billion to health. We forecast the South African economy to grow by 3.3% in 2021, 1.7% in 2022, and 1.5% in 2023. Why 3.3% in 2021? It's because of the base effects from a sharp contraction to a recovery. Deputy Speaker, let me say that the president, by putting an economic reconstruction and recovery plan, has ensured that we accelerate the growth potential of the economy. This will secure fiscal sustainability and build this economy better than before. The point we're making here is that we need to get the economy to grow so that we can collect more tax and therefore we can have a better fiscal sustainability situation. Turning now to the economic context. A sharp and hopefully short global recession is underway. The International Monetary Fund now expects global output to contract by 4.4% in 2020 before rebounding to 5.2% in 21, 2021. This is in the October World Economic Outlook. Growth in advanced countries is strengthening next year. Emerging market countries are set to grow by 6%. Sub-Saharan Africa, is expected to rebound to growth of 3.1% in 2021. As always, Africa has been at the forefront of innovative solutions to the crisis, including delivering social assistance through digital technology. Ex-Africa Semper Eliquid Novi. Deputy Speaker, you are now well aware that the country's aloferox is drought resistant. It can survive the harshest of circumstances and can certainly withstand a pandemic. Our little aloferox has survived. It is recovering very well. I was concerned at some stage that it might not be alive. In South Africa, the high frequency data that we collect suggests that green shoots are beginning to emerge. At this stage, it looks like there will be a strong rebound in the next quarter. This will be supported by the government's economic reconstruction and recovery plan. Already there is progress on implementation of the plan. Honorable members, improving the supply of electricity is urgent. In line with this plan, there is progress in allowing municipalities to buy electricity from different sources. In addition, the way has been opened for the procurement of almost 12,000 megawatts of new electricity capacity to be provided by independent power producers. The ongoing implementation of the ESCOM roadmap and the unbundling continues. Divisional managing directors and boards of directors have already been appointed. Infrastructure and structural reforms are at the center of the recovery plan. Mr. President, our government under your wise leadership 
has championed the infrastructure fund to implementation. And we are starting to see the results. Subsidies of 2.2 billion will support the social housing program aimed at poor working South Africans. A further 6.7 billion has been contractually committed to this program. And we expect the total investment amount from this program to be around 20 billion over the next 10 years. As a consequence of the infrastructure fund, the student housing program worth an estimated 96 billion rand is underway. It will service nearly 300,000 students a year when completed. The budget facility for infrastructure will support new projects, including through blended finance in partnership with the private sector. This includes hospitals, hospital projects in KwaZulu-Natal, such as the extension of the Chief Albert Lutulu Hospital, and in the Western Cape, like the Tigerberg and Klepfontein hospitals. This, by the way, this Tigerberg thing, this Tigerberg hospital thing, it still has a black and white section. There's a section where blacks used to go, and a section where whites used to go. So structurally, structurally it's still there. So the thing has to be removed. It's to be removed, has removed, and uh, a completely new, new um, uh, hospital constructed there. It's unbelievable. There, there are. I thought that was the DA government there. <clears throat> there are exciting new proposals for the development of more than 12 harbors in the Eastern Cape, KwaZulu-Natal, Northern Cape, and Western Cape. Finally, we will review Finally, we will review our existing public finance regulatory framework to unlock infrastructure investment by the broader government. Over and above this, the Independent Communications Authority of South Africa has issued an invitation for people to apply for the auction of additional spectrum. Government has initiated a process to review Regulation 28 to make it easier for retirement funds to increase their investments in infrastructure. <clears throat> Notwithstanding this encouraging progress, that there are priority structure reforms that require acceleration. As we have mentioned before, we have started Operation Volindlela as a critical coordination tool to unlock and fast-track implementation of the structural economic reform agenda. And the Deputy Minister, Masondo, is leading this initiative, and a technical team headed by Dr. Sean Phillips will draw on expertise and capacity from the private sector and the public sector as well. This will ensure that implementation is well-coordinated, sequenced, and timers. In the light of the launching of the Economic Reconstruction and Recovery Program, the Presidency will very much be involved with us in this process so that the Presidency can help us drive the program because they are at the center of government. Parliament plays an important role in this reform agenda. We thank this House for fast-tracking consideration for the economic regulation of transport bill. Under the leadership of the Minister of Health, government is exploring greater participation in the COVAX facility, a global initiative to ensure equitable access to future vaccines. In the area of social protection, we are happy to announce a historic agreement with all NEDLEC constituencies for the annuitization of provident funds beginning in March 2021 which will enable all workers to continue to enjoy tax deductions on their contributions. 
We thank the labor constituency for identifying appropriate annuity products for low income workers. The NADLEG, the NADLEG constituencies also agree to accelerate the introduction of auto enrollment for all employed workers and the establishment of a fund to cater for workers currently excluded from pension fund coverage as an urgent intervention towards a comprehensive social security system. Government will present legislation next year to allow for limited pension fund coverage. Government will present legislation next year to allow for limited pre-retirement withdrawals under certain circumstances linked to mandatory preservation requirements. Today, we announce further steps to make cross-border business easier, including inward listings, loop structures, and corporate foreign borrowings. In other words, exchange controls. Work is well advanced to modernize the cross-border flows management regime to support South Africa's growth as an investment and financial hub of the African continent. I now provide an update on the fiscal relief package. In April this year, government announced a major fiscal relief package of around 500 billion rand or 10% of GDP, including, there's a reason why I'm, I'm doing this, to answer the question, where has the 500 billion run gone? So one, more than 30 billion for health and other frontline services. Two, support for vulnerable households, which is now in excess of 50 billion rand. Three, more than 40 billion rand for wage protection through the unemployment insurance fund. Four, around 100 billion for job creation initiatives, which will now be spread over the MTEF. Five, 200 billion rand for a credit guarantee scheme, a scheme involving the National Treasury, South African Reserve Bank, and the banking sector. Six, 20 billion rand towards municipalities to assist them with COVID-19 related activities. Seven, 70 billion rand towards emergency tax measures, which are announced. That arithmetically makes up 500 billion. As the pandemic unfolded, some shifts in resources could be implemented. The resources for the relief package came from a variety of sources, including drawing down the UAF reserves, the issuing of new guarantees, and projected revenue losses. During the lockdown, cash grants were paid to over 22 million people, nearly half the population. To reach the poorest South African households, we expanded social protection. Seven million people access the temporary employment relief scheme through the UAF. The special COVID-19 social re relief of distress reached six million people. The government has decided to extend the social relief of distress grant to end to the end of January 2021. Because this grant is very effective in reaching the unemployed, we propose to redirect 6.8 billion rand from the public employment program towards this relief of distress. The temporary increases, unfortunately, for the top, of, over, of, uh, top up of the grants will have to come to an end, unfortunately. This adjustments appropriation also adds one billion rand for food relief to fight hunger. Honorable members, we are happy to announce today 
that we are allocating 12.6 billion in this financial year to the game-changing employment initiatives that are championed by the President. The provincial equitable share is augmented by 7 billion rand to support jobs at fee-paying public schools and government-subsidized independent schools. 600 million rand goes to employ early childhood development and social workers. Yeah. Incidentally, the social workers have been very important through this period in counseling people, help, helping people through the process. And very rarely do we say anything positive about the social workers, but they play an important role in social cohesion in our communities. Two billion rand is allocated for the working for fire. Working for fire, you, you stop the fire breaks. Uh, working for water, removing all these invasive plants, and so on. So, um, work is being done, and money is being allocated for these processes. The rest of the allocation from the Employment initiative is divided between transport, arts, sports, and culture, health, and agricultural sectors. The district development model will fast track infrastructure and general social economic development. We should see the return of the local economic development initiative, the LED, very critical to local economic development. The revised division of revenue for 2020-21 proposes allocations of 806.7 billion to national departments, 628.3 billion to, prov to provinces, and 139.9 billion to local government. We're often criticized as to why is the allocation to local government seemingly lower than province and national. People more often forget that in addition, local government can raise own revenue through the collection of rates and taxes and so on. So that's, that's why it's like that. If, if the situation was different, um, the, the, the picture would be up, upside down, to be local, then provincial, and national. But this is what we are. After extensive consultations between the Banking Association the National Treasury and the South African Reserve Bank, work is underway to re review the loan guarantee scheme to improve its take up. I will also be working with my colleagues in the cabinet to boost the business restart efforts. Basically, it means small business development and DTI. In summary, non interest spending in 2020 21 is unchanged relative to the special adjustments budgets at 1.6 trillion. All additional pressures have been accommodated through adjustments elsewhere. Gross tax revenue is revised down, but this is offset by other receipts into the National Revenue Fund. For example, there have been some exchange rates uh, benefits and so on, so that has improved uh, the situation. Main budget revenue is now projected to be 1.6 trillion less compared to the special adjustment budget. Debt service costs are revised down by 3.4 billion in part because of lower borrowing costs. So now I come to the revised main budget deficit. Altogether, the in-year revised main budget deficit is now expected to be 707 billion rand, a little better than during the special adjustments budget, as the ratio of GDP stays almost the same. The consolidated deficit is also marginally better in rand terms but unchanged as well as the proportion of GDP 
at around 15.7%. Government has broadened its financing, financing strategy to include drawing down on sterilization and foreign currency deposits. We're also borrowing at favorable rates from international financial institutions. Yes, from the IMF. Yes, from the African Development Bank. Yes, from the BRICS Bank. Uh, so there's no underground borrowing here. It's all in the open. I now turn to the medium term. Oh, incidentally, I, might, I can say it here, uh, the BRICS Bank is, also, is, is in conversation with us about extending another one billion US dollars uh, to us. I now turn to the medium term fiscal strategy. The medium term fiscal strategy. As we chart our way forward, we are reminded of the grizzly sea captain in Samuel Coleridge's poem, The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, who is hit by a great tempest that throws the ship of course. And I quote, and now the storm blast came, and he was tyrannous and strong. He struck with his overtaking wings and chased us south along, unquote. Our job is not to tremble in fear at the storm blast, neither at plagues nor at the wide open mouth of the hippopotamus. Armed with a strong sense of direction, steadfastness, resolution, and determination, we face these perils head on. Our compass points towards fiscal sustainability, and we must all face the same way. In June, we published the medium-term spending plans and long-term debt projections to spark robust debate on our fiscal path. Here in this house, within the government, with community activists, with civil society, with the trade union movement, and with our provincial and municipal colleagues, with small and big business, in opinions expressed by the media platforms. We are grateful for the constructive criticism. We normally uh, listen to all conversations. We hear the productive ones we don't hear the unproductive ones. We listen to all, we hear the productive ones, we don't hear the unproductive ones. South Africans love a debate, as we all know. I'm sure you like this, even about garlic. <clears throat> this is a glorious, loud, and very active democracy that we so hard fought for. Mr. President, you summarized the consensus two weeks ago, and I quote, we cannot sustain the current levels of debt, particularly as increasing borrowing costs are diverting resources that should be going to economic and social development, unquote. We must now rally behind fiscal rehabilitation and growth. Right now, Government is borrowing at a rate of 2.1 billion rand per day. Madam Speaker, this cannot continue. We must be careful to avoid the fate of countries such as Argentina and Ecuador that have defaulted on their debt this year. Countries that find themselves in default usually see sharp GDP contractions and current major currency depreciations. On current trends, more of our taxes have been transferred to bondholders who hold our debt, rather than to critical services for our people. An uncontrolled increase in borrowing costs would harm small business, ordinary South Africans, and the poor the most. The cabinet remains resolute and it will walk through the narrow gate towards fiscal sustainability. Uh, before today, the economy languished 
in a trap of paralysis. As the rhyme of the ancient mariner would say, as idle as a painted ship upon a painted ocean, unquote. Today we break free from some of the risks that we have been facing. We face this question all the time. Why don't we spend our way out of the present crisis? What's wrong with you people in the National Treasury? Why don't you spend your way out of this crisis? Well, certainly in 2009, when we had debt of 31.5% of GDP, and the yield, the real yield on government debt was about 3%, every rand of government spent got us one one rand and 60 cents in GDP. So one rand spent G in GDP terms, one rand 60. It's in 2009. Now, however, at such elevated real interest rates, every additional rand gets less than a rand in GDP. So the situation has changed. As John Maynard Keynes said, when the situation changes, I change my mind. Don't you say. You have to change your mind. Otherwise, you suffer from what we call an uchlapi approach. Irrespective of the situation, you just keep moving. Even when there's a flood in front of you, you just keep going into the water. So it means we're actually far more poorer than we thought we were. And it is easy to see why. As we borrow more, we pay even more in debt servicing costs. We have also not been spending sufficiently on infrastructure, which is important in long-term economic growth. We act here to instill confidence amongst discouraged work seekers. Deputy Speaker, we stand here before you to instill confidence amongst discouraged work seekers. Businesses which have been bruised by the lockdown and, and facing uncertainty. Farmers and farm workers who produce the food for the country. And our international partners who know that South Africa is a great place to invest. Amongst other things, we will, one, make it easy to do business. We must remove the needlessly complex red tape that increases the cost of doing business. Two, we must create a stable and predictable set of policies. As we rebuild, there must be universal understanding of the policy trajectory of our government. It is not only investors that need confidence, but also every person needs confidence. As a farmer, I plant because I know in seven years' time I'm going to reap what I planted. I want to see those avocados in seven years. I need to have the confidence to plant today because I won't reap tomorrow. I will harvest in seven years' time. But I need the policy certainty in this regard. Three, we must use our ingenuity and adapt after the ravages of the pandemic. We must be creative. Not everything is going to come from the government, but it has to be a combination of government, private enterprise, private individuals, small and medium enterprises coming together, with the banking sector coming in to provide the lubricants for the economy to function. Four, we must embrace a sustainable future and work towards a green and just transition. And avoid fighting amongst each other and pointing fingers, whether it's at Senegal or everywhere, creating a sense of a country that's about to collapse. We must avoid that and all work together in building the future of this country. The future of work is going to be different 
in the post-lockdown period. We're seeing it already. We're seeing it here in Parliament. That we are not all here as we usually should be. It's a different working situation. We see it in government departments, in the private sector, uh, that technology is now key. And going forward, technology is going to be key for the rebuilding of the economy. I've been surprised since I arrived here in Cape Town that driving from the office here to my residence has become much easier. There's less congestion. The power of technology. Now, <clears throat> now, uh, as we go forward together, as I indicated above, as part of our post-pandemic re rehabilitation, I actually prefer to call it post-lockdown rehabilitation, we need to come together to forge a new consensus on the public sector employee co uh, compensation. We need a strategic conversation, one which takes into account the needs of the country as a whole. Our compatriots in the private sector have already made sacrifices and even negotiated salary reductions to keep the businesses afloat. Over the past five years, public sector employee compensation grew by 7.2% a year on average, well above inflation. Over the next five years, it will need to grow much, much lower. The Minister of the Department of Public Service and Administration and the leadership of the public service unions are meeting to discuss how best to adapt to this new reality. That we have to do more with less and that we're in this together. We also wish to thank the minister and the trade unions in the public sector that he's talking to for the seriousness with which they are approaching this matter. I must stress, however, that our public servants do very important work for our country. They are patriots. They too wish to unburden our country of debt. They want to bequeath assets and not liabilities to the next generation. Still, we cannot expect our civil service to carry the burden of nation building alone. Consideration, therefore, should be given to the proposal for an across-the-board compensation pay reductions to management level positions across national, provincial, and municipal governments, state-owned enterprises, and all other senior public representatives. Consideration should be given to the proposal for the across-the-board compensation pay reductions to management level positions across national, provincial, and municipal governments, state-owned enterprises, as well as all other senior public representatives. Now, progress on zero-based budgeting and spending reviews. Zero-based budgeting will be piloted at the Department of Public Enterprises, but also at the National Treasury next year. This will be a fully integrated process going into the budget system for the 23 budget. In practice, it will mean program by program, budget by budget, project by project analysis. We must discard those things that we no longer need to do and scale up those that are essential for progress. Can't continue doing the same thing all over again. It's too expensive. Doesn't produce any result. You know, it's like a crab that thinks it's going forward, but it's going sideways. Not helpful. Now I come to state owned enterprises. Deputy Speaker, Honorable Members, Mr. President, 3 billion rand was allocated to the land bank in June. 
The bank will require an additional 7 billion rand over the medium term to support its restructuring and refocus. Ten point five billion rand is allocated to SAA to implement its business rescue plan. Well, let me repeat. Let me repeat. Ten point five billion rand is allocated to SAA to no no listen to implement its business rescue plan. This allocation. This allocation is funded through reductions to the baselines of national departments, public entities, and conditional grants. This allocation is in addition to the 16.4 billion rand allocated over the 2020 MTF in the February budget for settling, for settling guaranteed debt and interest. You can't run away from your obligations. You can't run away from your obligations. Uh, you can't run away from your obligations. Our approach is in line with the principle that funding to state-owned enterprises must come within the current framework and reprioritize from elsewhere. We need, however, to make it clear that the continuous funding of inefficient, non-functional, state-owned enterprises has to be reconsidered. In this instance, we will work together with the Department of Public Enterprises to deal with these matters. For our part, we are determined that whatever the demands, we cannot break the fiscal framework. The final part of our duties as captains through the storm is to strengthen the ship. The COVID-19 pandemic has given rise to shameful and exploitative acts of corruption. This has overshadowed our collective achievements in saving lives and supporting livelihoods. We must continue the, the defeat, our efforts to defeat the corrupt and plug the loopholes. Efforts to support a rapid response to COVID-19 undermine the need for the, no, underline the need for a comprehensive procurement reform. The National Treasury has withdrawn the emergency procurement instruction notes and required all bodies to revert to normal procurement processes. <laughs> procurement is now slowed down due to a few scoundrels who put themselves ahead of our country. We must all suffer as a result of their actions. The details of all COVID-19 related procurement, including the names of companies awarded contracts, have been published. The majority of health spending takes place at provincial level. Provinces are taking actions against those found to have been involved in corrupt practices. The South African Revenue Service is working with other law enforcement agencies to evaluate 3.5 billion rand worth of tenders which were awarded to entities not registered for VAT. In addition, the State Capture Commission of Inquiry is allocated an additional amount of 63 million rand from the Department of Justice to finalize investigations hearings and produce a close-out report. Honorable Speaker, Deputy Speaker rather, President and members of the House, today we set out a course back to prosperity. Growth is slowly, slowly returning. As I said, the green shoots are beginning to show. Things are looking much better. The 2020 MTB medium-term budget policy statement sets out our course forward. Just to remind members, we intend to run a primary surplus on the main budget by 25-26.
by constraining non-interest spending growth. Two, we shift spending from consumption to investment. Over the MTF, the fastest growing item, other than debt service costs, is spending on capital goods, i.e. investment, which is projected to grow at 7.8% a year. We allocate resources for the economic reconstruction and recovery program. Now, of course, uh, uh, my ACDP colleagues will be very unhappy if I don't uh, turn to the holy book. <clears throat> the gospel according to John chapter 12, verse 35, quote, you are going to have the light just a little longer. Walk while you have the light before darkness overtakes you. Whoever walks in the dark does not know where they're going. So walk while there's still a little light. In economic terms, it means do something whilst you still have an opportunity to do. Today, we embrace our higher purpose as citizens and leaders to take forward the vision of nation building. Together, we can shape a new destiny for a great, vibrant, beautiful country. Our thanks go to the President and the Deputy President for their support, Cabinet colleagues, the members of the Minister's Committee on the Budget, called MinCombat, the MECs of Finance, Team Finance. Thanks are also due to the Chairpersons of the Standing Committee on Finance and Appropriations Committee, Mr. Joe Maswangani and Mr. Sfiso Butelezi, respectively, and members of the respective parliamentary committees. The medium-term budget policy statement coincides today with another important process, the tabling of the tax bills, as I mentioned. I'm grateful to the standing, standing and select committees of, on appropriations and finance for the work they've done already. They have the responsibility for steering the consideration of the tax bills, giving effect to the revenue proposals as announced in the 2020 uh, annual budget. In February, and related administration matters, they will also consider the 2020 Division of Revenue Second Amendment Bill and the 2020 Second Adjustments Appropriation Bill. We would also like to thank the Governor of the South African Reserve Bank, Mr. Lisey Jack Hanyaho, and his staff for their continued collaboration with us whilst maintaining the independence of the respective institutions. A special word of thanks goes to the Deputy Minister of Finance, Dr. David Masondo, and the Director General of the National Treasury, Mr. Dondo Mukhajane, and the team, and the team for their courage, hard work, and commitment. <laughs> Finally, we express our thanks to uh, members of this House as a whole. We express also appreciation to the people of South Africa who continue to work with us as we chart the way to a promising destination. Uh, you can see. to the relevant committees. That concludes, that concludes the business for the day. The House is adjourned. Well, of course, uh, the finance minister, Tito Mboweni, has just delivered his budget speech, uh, just basically saying that he's going to be looking to cut expenditure by 300 billion rand over the 2020 to 20, sorry, the 2021 to 2024 uh, fiscal year, over three years, 300 billion rand. That's how much he wants to cut the budget by or the spending by. He also expects a shortfall of revenue for this fiscal year, that is the 2020 to 2021 fiscal year, of 313 billion rand. So he's almost trying to 
equalize if you can if we can say that of course he continues to uh, support those who are less vulnerable uh, 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 basically confirming that indeed that social relief of distress uh, grant will continue to be given until the end of january and uh, he indicated that 6.8 billion rand would be transferred from one place to another uh, uh, right i'm just joined now I'm joined now by somebody from the DA. Uh, just hello there, sir. Hello. How are you? I'm fine. Are you? Okay, we're live on air, and I'm very overwhelmed indeed. Please just introduce yourself. I know that you're Mr. Jordan, somebody, uh, <laughs> but please do tell us who you are and just Jordan give us your Jordan, somebody indeed. Yes. Jordan Hill Lewis. Uh, Thank DA you so Shadow much, Minister. sir. Please do tell us what your immediate reaction is on the midterm budget. We know that you are very vocal on it, as you are in the economic uh, division of the DA. Thanks so much. It's nice to be with you. I think there's two key takeaways for me or that I'd like to focus on right now. The first is the bailout of South African Airways. I think that is a critical failure, I'm afraid. The minister has made this a matter of principle many years. Uh, he's been warning the country and promising that there will be no further bailouts. And he has retreated on that. He's abandoned that commitment and there will be another 10.5 billion on top of the 16.5 they got in February. Mm. That's unacceptable given the pressure and, and suffering that so many South African families are feeling right now. The second retreat that the minister made today was from his so-called active scenario from July. You will remember that well. And that commitment only lasted three months because today he said actually the active scenario will not be achieved. We won't stabilize debt by 2023. Actually, it'll only be by 25, 26. And it'll be another trillion rand with a T in debt. Uh, now, what that means practically for ordinary South Africans is that we are spending so much more on interest that we are going to be cutting into things like police, uh, health care, uh, higher education. All of those things are being cut in today's budgets. Mm. Uh, and I heard in your introduction about uh, support for the, for the vulnerable, but yes. actually crime is a, a crisis in this country. The police budget is being cut by two and a half billion today. Mm all to pay debt and to pay for SAA. And we think that is totally unacceptable. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Jordan Lewis. Thank you very much. Okay, Thank super. You. If I may take your mic. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Now, now I'm joined by the ACDP uh, representative just to give us his thoughts on what's come out of the budget. Sir, thank you very much for your time. Tell thank us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, from the ACDP's perspective, we are deeply concerned about the lack of stewardship when it comes to dealing with government resources. The spiraling government debt levels up to 5.5 trillion is totally unacceptable. And we see the public outrage that has been expressed by the high levels of fraud and corruption, particularly now with the COVID-19 and, of course, state capture and corruption. We have to start collecting the stolen funds and ensuring that those that are guilty of corruption are locked away. At the moment, when you look at the strict fiscal consolidation path that the minister is setting out, it will require billions and billions of rands to pay the debt service costs, which crowds out the much needed economic reforms that we need, social reforms that we need. So we are saying we need an economic recovery plan to be instituted as a matter of urgency. This will result in economic growth, which will result in greater revenue being collected, and that then will help, will balance the budget. But at the moment, it is a great concern of ours that the fiscal consolidation path has been extended when it should have been brought in and we should have seen fiscal consolidation earlier. Mm. It is postponing the inevitable and that is what the minister is concerned about and that is a sovereign debt crisis. We've got to do everything to avoid that. Thank you so much. Thank you much, so much, sir. Thank you. Okay, now I'm joined by Mr. Mkwankwa. He's from the UDM. Thank you so much, sir, for joining us. Your immediate reaction to the budget speech, please. Well, the, the government's priorities are upside down if you look at it. You have a government that says, that calls on civil servants, it calls on public representatives to make sacrifices to take a pay cut over the next few years, which is fine. We're prepared to enter into that discussion. But the very same government decides to actually give more than 10 billion rents to SAA as a bailout package. Uh, which means that it's almost like a provider of a family of a father who decides to buy a Christmas tree when the family doesn't have bread and butter on the table. 
The other concern for us is that if you look at the country's finances, look how our debt to GDP ratio is expected to stand at about 95% in 2023 2024. Look at the debt service costs of 343 or just almost 350 billion rents during that very same period. It means that for the next 10 years or so, we're going to spend more money servicing our debt, the debt costs, rather than being able to spend them on the social wage. This has to do, obviously, with what we've been warning government over the years to say. They, they eroded the fiscal space unnecessarily over the past 10 years. Mm. And, but the problem with that is that there was no value for money. Uh, try to show me programs or projects that we have managed to done successfully with the more than trillion rents that we've borrowed over the past couple of years or 10 years since 2008. You will not see anything. Even if there's something on the ground, it's been done shortly. It had to be redone at some point. So it's a management issue. So you're not satisfied? No, no, no. This is just, um, I mean, it was uh, full of sound and fury, but lacking in detail and lacking in, a, in the true sense of the word, in the plan that's going to turn around South Africa. Thank you, sir, for Much your time. Much obliged to you. Super. Mr. Ngosi Butelezi, if uh, you could come over. Okay, just uh, observing protocols. Thank you, sir, for joining us. If we could just get your, uh, your immediate reaction to the budget speech. In fact, uh, the starting point by the minister where he quoted uh, former President Mandela giving us hope showed that there is something serious that is to come. The reality is that uh, the unemployment rate is very high, our economy is like shrinking and there is no real brighter future ahead of us. But uh, we were happy in fact, to have him touching on some of the other issues, in particular the money that will be given to the land bank, because as the IFP, we always champion the need for the poor of the poor in the deep rural areas, because agriculture is very important. But as the IFP, we, we didn't hope that the minister would pour so much money into SAA, regardless of the fact that they want to restart the company. But we have been saying, we have been expecting him to speak on the lines of bringing a private partner because government has failed to take care of that uh, state-owned entity. Mm. And just in terms of the, the budget in broad terms, did you think that it uh, did well in terms of balancing our debt situation? It did not at all because our debt continues to grow. And uh, that is a very serious problem because he mentioned himself that we run a risk of getting into a dead trap, which is a serious problem for us as the country. And he didn't speak nothing as to how the government planned to stop leakages in the system in terms of corruption and making sure that these leakages, which are stealing so much money that could save the debt itself, is actually addressed. Thank you, sir, for your time. Thank you very much. And so now, now next I'm joined by Sfiso. Butelezi, he's from the ANC, if he's going to come. Yep, he's coming. Mr. Butelezi, thank you very much for your time, sir. Can I take it up? Yes, you may. Um, we just wanted to get your immediate reaction to the uh, budget statement, if you could uh, tell us, and you can look directly at me. We welcome the, 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 the MTBS presented by the Minister of Finance. Obviously, it's a very difficult budget. Uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic has uh, disorganized everybody. The world over is, 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 is under very, very uh, difficult uh, economic conditions. But what is, what is important is that this uh, uh, mid-term budget comes after the president had presented the economic reconstruction and recovery plan. All what we need to focus on now is what the social partners have agreed upon, that is labor, business, uh, civil society and the government. Now we need to implement that, uh, uh, that plan. Yeah. So the, where we are, we believe that the, our way out of this uh, situation is for us to get the economy back to a, a growth trajectory so that we can be in a position to create more jobs, get more revenue, deal with the debt to GDP ratio, which is deteriorating and the, uh, the, the, the primary deficit. Speaking to opposition uh, parties just now, they seem to be quite disappointed that National Treasury has gone ahead to support SAA with 10.5 billion rand. You know, when, when is the government going to stop throwing money at SAA? I think the, the minister was very clear on, on, on the SAA. We, we have got guarantees. The debts of, of, of SAA are guaranteed by government. So we can't be seen to be uh, rene reneging on, on, on those obligations. So first and foremost, he was very clear that we need to do that. We have got debt that we, we, we need to pay. We have got a guaranteed debt. That means that once we have said as a government that this debt, if this company, if this SOE can't pay, we are guaranteeing it. 
If you are not going to do that, it means it was going to be very difficult for you in the future to raise any money from the bond markets. Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Butelezi, for your time. Let me take that mic from you. Thank you so much. Okay, next now we're going to be joined by Willie Madisha. He's from COPE and uh, he's going to give us his view on what's going on. Thank you so much, Mr. Madisha, for joining us. Uh, your reaction to uh, Tito Mboweni's uh, midterm budget, please. I must say that we are extremely disappointed because what he said is what has been said over the past 20 years. You know, when they spoke about the RDP as GISA, uh, new growth path, etc. Mm. And there has not been any implementation. That is why we are where we are at the moment. Poverty, etc. There is no implementation. They don't have the capacity. Secondly, unemployment rate in our country is more than uh, half the population. Now, he says over the next coming uh, 10 years, they will have created one million uh, uh, jobs. Now, that does not say anything. It means they disregard the creation of jobs. Only 100,000 people will be implemented. And that is extremely wrong. Now, the other point that we want to raise is that if you want to talk about the growth uh, 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 path, yes. uh, you've got to have uh, what we believe is the welfare kind of state. But then what they are doing is to make sure that our people simply get those 300 rand, 350 rand, but no jobs. But then that, as I say, will create a very serious problem and will not go anywhere altogether. Now, the other thing is that they insist that uh, they must just go on and borrow and borrow and borrow. And yet there is a lot of money, that, lots and lots of resources in South Africa. They are mines. But then what they do is to take these resources overseas and then thereafter go and buy what they have taken there, the products they go and buy, and we lose a lot of money. Mm. So we are not getting anywhere no. altogether. Thank you, sir, for your uh, feedback on the budget. Thank, Thank you, you very so much. much. That was uh, Mr. Willy Madisha. Now I'm joined by Mr. Khunavad. He's from FF Plus, just to give us his view on the budget. Thank you so much, sir, for joining us. Uh, just give us your, your immediate reaction to the budget, please. Well, firstly, I want to put it very clearly. As far as I'm concerned, the minister is in checkmate. If you look, for instance, the projected uh, deficit on the budget with mature loans, are going to be 770 billion this year alone. If you look at the gross debt of the government, we're talking about 3.9 trillion rand increasing to 5.5 trillion by the end of this medium term. Yes. The service cost alone of that debt at the moment is 233 billion annually, increasing to 355 billion. So there's no movement for the minister. And what we can't understand is that there is a bailout of 10.4 billion for SAA, where he is on record, where he said, well, there is no money. He's quite correct. There is no money. But what he did then is that he took some money, as he calls it, a conditional grants, which is mainly for local government. And the government on local uh, level is the big problem. They don't have enough money for water, for sanitation. So the minister is taking money for water and sanitation, giving to the SAA. And you can ask yourself, who are the people really flying SAA? So we said, say that he should have uh, just stopped it and said, anybody who wants to take SAA, they can take it. The other big problem is uh, the salary or the wage bill of government. He started, he said that they will have to cut it with 160 billion. He didn't give a final figure in the end. But what he did is he is taking 14.1 billion from the educational department for uh, decreasing the wage bill. But what I can't understand is the president a couple of weeks ago announced that 200,000 200, assistants for educators are going to create that jobs for them. So he's going to give 200,000 more people into the education uh, department, but he's taking 14.1 billion from their salary. It just doesn't make sense. The minister is in checkmate and he's only moving the chairs on the top deck of the Titanic. 
Thank you very much, sir, for your time. That uh, it's Mr. Hunewald. Uh, he's from FF Plus. As you can hear, a lot of dissatisfaction right now about the budget. Uh, not really much positive feedback, except from uh, the ANC. Uh, now I'm joined uh, by Ma'am, um, uh, just to give us her reaction. Thank you very much, Ma'am. If you could introduce, just introduce yourself and uh, tell us your reaction to the midterm budget, please. My name is Pemi Majudina. I'm the chief whip of the African National Congress. Thank you very much. And your reaction, please, ma'am? I welcome the, the, the speech by the minister. This speech is taking us forward. It, it gives us hope because out of the speech, you could hear that there is a budget that is meant for infrastructure investment. And true infrastructure investment is where we're going to create more jobs, is where we're going to reach out to poor and rural areas for better facilities, but also we need sustainable jobs so as to take people out of the grant and give them sustainable work. That's what we are, we are looking for. And as ANC, we think this is uh, complementing what the president has said, because out of the, 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 the speech by the president or the address, the president was saying these are the following things that are going to do, but that needed money. Therefore, this budget is supplementing exactly the action plan of how president is going to implement what he, he committed. Yes, but of course uh, the major thing that's coming out from opposition parties is their unhappiness with uh, the uh, giving of 10.5 billion rand to SAA and of course the minister says obligations have to be observed but in the February budget when he was giving over 16.4 billion rand to SAA over the medium term he said that's it, we don't have enough but now suddenly the story has changed. Yes, the story has changed because there are employees, there are obligations that were made some time ago and you cannot just cut off without um, uh, observing those obligations. This is a rescue plan. We are not resuscitating SAA. There will be a new uh, airline but you have to round off SAA and pay all the outstanding debts. That is what this money is meant for. And as parliament we are going to do our robust oversight to check each and every cent to avoid what has happened on COVID-19. So we have uh, strengthened our oversight role as parliament. Thank you so much, ma'am, for Thank your you. time. Super. Okay, so now, uh, as, as you can hear, varying views on the midterm budget. Uh, we are going to cross now over to my colleague, Arabile Gumede. And as soon as we get more guests, you can come back to us, of course. Yeah, Nompu, thank you so much for that then. Of course, it gets very interesting now, right? That is uh, the speech then having delivered by the finance minister, Di Tomboweni. That's his medium-term budget policy statement. A whole host of matters coming to the fore, of course, uh, across the ground. One of the key salient issues has been the uh, state-owned enterprises and just how much more money we're going to continue to give to them. The highlights of that were the $3 billion that was already allocated, of course, and given to the land, back, uh, the land bank that is back in June. And now they're going to be allocated to the further 7 billion rand as well to try and get them uh, to force their restructuring as well as they try to build themselves up. They had struggled to pay their debts back uh, as well in June and now a similar issue, COVID-19 eating into that business case. 10.5 billion rand allocated to SAA to implement its business rescue plan. That is perhaps what ticks off quite a few people. Of course, let's remember that they're already getting 16.4 billion rand as well then uh, over the medium term uh, expenditure framework, which was announced back in February then uh, by Finance Minister Tito Mboweni. So that is now what is ticking off a whole host of people saying, well, we're going to keep supplying money to the SOEs is what it feels like. It gets so difficult to continue to say we're going to be prudent when you just keep on shipping off more money to those SOEs. Let's head back to uh, Cape Town then with my colleague there, Nompo Melelo Siziba. More guests, more conversations, Nompo, as we continue to round up the proceedings of the MTBPS. Thanks very much, Arabile. I'm joined by Lula Manchaisa. He's from AIC. the AIC. Thank you so much, thank you so much sir, for joining us. Just give us, us. Just your, give reaction us your reaction to the term budget. Term budget. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the, uh, there's really nothing new, nothing remarkable. Of course, the minister was trying to give us some hope, but most of the things that we expected to say, he didn't say. For instance, I was just expecting him to say more about the GBV, to come to the GBV, because it's a because lot, it's, a lot. It's, 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 it's very much very much problematic in our country. So he didn't say nothing, he didn't say anything about that. And again, now we're very much surprised now when we heard he's saying that an amount of 10 billion is going to be given to SAA. 
But what else can we do? Because we, do, we need to have the national airline. But what we say is, yeah, is, is that, of course, money is going to be given, but we should see people being arrested because it's clear that there's a lot of corruption there. Mm -hmm. If you don't arrest people who just give money, it means no, there's nothing that is being done. Yes. So we see, want to see the people being arrested now. Did, you, did you think he spoke strongly enough around corruption and the fact that now people can't just uh, go through, do their procurements quickly, they've remo removed no, that ability? No, not at all. We're not very much satisfied. Yeah, he didn't speak too much about that. Because he thought that perhaps you now I would say something, how is the corruption going to be dealt with? Which is a problem in our country. So yeah. not so much did he speak about corruption. That Thank is why now we're complaining as I see now. Thank you very much, sir, for joining us. Uh, Lulama Jaisa from the AIC. Uh, not a happy chappy around the midterm budget saying it's same old, same old. Very worried about corruption, as many other people are. Not very confident that uh, this scourge that we continue to experience as a country has yet really been dealt with in a serious way. Uh, Arabile, I'm going to cross back to you. And of course, as things develop here on the floor, we will, of course, uh, you will, of course, come back to us. But for now, that's all we have for you. Yeah. Thank you so much for that, Nompo Melele. We'll continue to try and get as much reaction as possible then. Polit uh, political sphere, of course, is where Nompo is sitting at, and that's where that reaction comes from. But let's try and get a political economic sphere report then on what exactly has now transpired. Daniel Silk, the director at Political Futures Consulting, joins us. Was that good enough for you? Did that perhaps tilt things around in any particular direction? Did that offer any kind of solace? Hello, uh, Look, there's no solace here, and there won't be solace here for a number of years, given what the minister has said. The bottom line is, can the minister sell the cost-cutting program to his own trade unions, which has been difficult up until now? The figures are more stark uh, in terms of what the minister announced. The uh, salary freeze is more stark than perhaps what was expected. Uh, and I think there's a political dynamic that uh, we simply don't know how it will unfold over the next few months and into the next few years. And similarly, so the, the, the minister also you know, has announced the potential of revenue generation through tax, uh, increased taxes over the next three to four years or so. Uh, it's not spelled out very clearly at all. We know increasing taxes don't always come to fruition. In fact, they can have a, a negative effect uh, on morale and on collection for that matter. So I think what we've seen here is uh, an attempt at um, you know, crisis management in the short term and the proof will be in the pudding over the medium term. Yeah, it feels as though his notion to quite a bit more spending, but not really as to where the revenue will actually come from. I mean, uh, some of the savings will counteract exactly what he's uh, spoken about here. He hopes that the economy will grow by 3.3% in 2021. That's a major base effect, of course, having come from the negativity of this year. Do you think he was bold enough? Well, the policy framework is still unclear. And if the policy framework was clearer, we could very well have an, uh, an increase in domestic and foreign investment into South Africa that would increase the growth rate and would raise revenue. So it's all going to be about policy clarity, prudent economic policy, the structural reforms that we've been speaking about for months and months and months. Uh, that, to me, still has to come to the party. There's been some movement on that. Uh, but it's not enough, I think, to alleviate the concerns of both foreign and uh, domestic investors. And, and, and similarly, really, I mean, you know, government actually has to become much more efficient in how it manages its own cash. Uh, at local government level, where we have dysfunctional local administrations, we can't go on with unfunded mandates to the tune of millions or billions of rand. So the responsibility now is not only on policy, but it's also on government to... Uh, be more efficient and thereby to uh, introduce its own savings in this entire very complex equation. Yeah, over the past five years, public sector employee compensation grew by 7.2% a year on average, well above inflation. And then he notes and says over the next five years, it will need to grow much, much slower. He then uh, panders to the base quite prodigiously there by saying how significant and how important uh, the, the public workers and public servants are at this point in time. He still hasn't given us a sense of where to from here, what's happening. Do you feel like uh, government still is, is, is sort of paddling up a creek, unfortunately, and still not really doing it too well? 
of government always has to weigh up the realities of the economic situation that we are in, the excessive government spend and also excessive borrowing that the minister announced with the political ramifications of cutting back on this bloated bureaucracy in terms of numbers and in terms of salaries. Uh, you know, what we see today is not just a feature of COVID, it's a feature of the last 10 years of government increasing its wage bill. And it's increased its wage bill partially because there's a political imperative to do so. So the rubber has hit the road, Arabili, in terms of how much more money government can afford. It's hit the road. And I think it has to make some very hard decisions. It now has to bite the political bullet, to use a corny cliche, uh, which can, in fact, end in a, uh, a series of, I think, very difficult few months and, in fact, few years for the Ramaphosa administration as it finally merges economic reality with, of course, the political risk that it must take. Yep, when an immovable force then meets an unstoppable one there on this other side. It gets so difficult. Daniel, appreciate the time. Thank you so much for joining us here on SABC News. Daniel Silk, uh, political economy uh, analyst there and political futures consulting uh, director there, joining us as well. It's a difficult uh, budget to have certainly set for that this time. Of course, the constraints are quite heavy. In the conclusion, then, the finance minister even goes on to say, today we set out a course to prosperity. Growth is slowly returning. Things are looking better. It's very difficult to see exactly how things will continue to look better when a lot of our money is still going to continue to be spent through onto SOEs, which are dysfunctional at this point in time. Uh, it seems that corruption has continued continue to uh, weigh in on South Africa's economic future. Where to? Where do we get any of this growth picture that we continuously try to tout as well then? Uh, progress with regards to the zero-based budgeting model that the minister has continued to speak about uh, heavily. He says that zero-based budgeting will be piloted at the uh, Department of Public Enterprises and National Treasury next year, and hopefully it will then become a part uh, of the budget system as well by the 2023 year. That will be quite interesting to also see out as well as we made note of there just what is needed from uh, the uh, compatriots there when it comes to the public sector wage bill not setting a figure in stone not setting exactly uh, how much playing things a little too close to the chest perhaps uh, when one takes a look at the uh, public servants and their expenditure and what exactly is going to happen uh, on that front uh, the note as well comes through then from the finance minister saying that amongst other things we will make it easier to do business we must remove the needlessly complex red tape that increases the cost of doing business. Now, having tweeted this a little bit earlier, the question was, well, you've said the same thing for numerous years and still no response. We're getting uh, the sense that you keep saying this in order to just appeal to a base and still not get it done. What is it that perhaps needs to be unlocked when it comes to the red tape issue? The small businesses who are certainly struggling at this point in time and trying to get through uh, some of their uh, entities and build, creating a stable and predictable uh, set of policies as we rebuild. There must be universal understanding of the policy trajectory. It seems that even government itself perhaps does not understand exactly where the policy trajectory exactly is going. So how then will you be able to create an understandable one for the broader society, the rest of South Africa? It is not only investors that need confidence, but also the average South African. I can tell you this much, the average South African living in this country might find it difficult to believe exactly where they're going to get this confidence from when you also have an unemployment rate sitting at 42% an absolute travesty to an economy and a uh, party as well. And even a government that has uh, said that they will put people first and ensure that they have everything they need. Another point that came out then from the finance minister speaking about the international partners was we must use our ingenuity and adapt after the ravages of the pandemic. How do we do that without spending perhaps a little bit more money, which is going to be absolutely necessary too, is it not? Uh, and embrace a sustainable future and work towards a green and just transition. All of these words just sound absolutely great, but can we get anywhere with any of it? It doesn't seem like it's working at all. Of course, one of the most stark uh, sentences to have perhaps come out of the budget, uh, the medium-term budget policy statement there by the finance minister, Tito Mboweni, was that right now government is borrowing at a rate of 2.1 billion rand a day. 
And that he then says after that, that, Madam Speaker, we must be careful to avoid the fate of countries like Argentina and Ecuador, uh, Ecuador, that is, that defaulted on their debt this year. It seems more like a question of when and not if, considering the path that we've currently taken. We are continuing to ask ourselves, where exactly are we going to get the funds from? Where exactly are we going to try to perhaps build this South African economy with a state of borrowing of 2.1 billion rand per day? I can certainly guarantee that it becomes difficult. Of course, that does exclude weekends, as we've often been told by National Treasury. Uh, indeed, the difficulty in trying to find the growth picture for South Africa uh, moving forward uh, is going to be a very tough one from here on in. Now, here's another asset, uh, aspect that perhaps we can uh, talk towards then. It is the government, or rather Treasury's notion, that they will intend to run primary surpluses on the main budget. Now, let's explain that sentiment then. And this is said to happen by 2025 and 2026. The main budget is, of course, just the budget that is put forward in terms of uh, how much money is received and how much money is then spent by National Treasury. In order to run a primary surplus, that would mean you'd have to still bring in more money than you are spending. To do that, you also need fiscal, uh, fiscal consolidation. This is what uh, the National Treasury or the Finance Minister said that he would put forward in this medium-term budget policy statement, that it would have three years of fiscal consolidation. And in order to get that right, it also means that you cannot spend as frivolously as you have been doing over the past number of years. Yes, that includes the wage bill. Yes, that includes SOEs as well, the likes of SAA continuing to get money. The Land Bank, which, yes, has been a profitable entity for a number of years, but this year continues to struggle and now needs even more money in order to get it right. So all of those struggles, including ESCOM, including Denel, including the SABC, all of which are an absolute struggle then, of course, for many. We also want to shift spending from consumption to investment. How difficult are you going to get that right when you still have to sort out your debt? Many portfolio managers will tell you that it may not be such a great idea to get into your investments if you're still sitting with debt. So how then do you plan for the future in that regard? Let's go back to a guest that I spoke to just before the medium-term budget policy statement, Martin Davies from Deloitte, joining us again now. Martin, did you get a sense there that we're perhaps contradicting ourselves in many instances. I certainly felt like we are. We're saying today we set a course back to prosperity. Growth is slowly returning. Things are looking better. It's, a, it's an empty BPS that is supposed to imply fiscal consolidation, but we're going to spend, spend, spend. Where are we going? Yeah, Rabila, thank you. It's, uh, are we more depressed than we were a couple of hours ago? Um, <laughs> well, not imp maybe not depressed, but not overly impressed. That's the best mm -hmm. way of putting it. I think for me, the, the, the disappointing part for me really it talks to was the very beginning of, 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 of um, Finance Minister Hittemba when his comments, where he was talking about growth uh, outlook. He spoke for about a 3% and decimal pointage um, sort of forecast for uh, for 2021. Obviously, he talked off a low base, and that's yep. 2020. But then the following year, he spoke about a sort of a 1%, one, 1.5% one growth forecast. Yeah, 1.7 in 2022 and 1.5 in 2023. Yeah, that's the figures he put out. And that is, that's appalling. Is that the extent of our ambition? Mm. That's below our population growth rate. So if your GDP growth rate is lower than your population growth rate, and effectively be, you're becoming poorer on a per capita basis, not so. So I, I can't understand the lack of ambition. There's no reason why an economy like ours should not be forecasting three and a half, four percent growth constantly ongoing. We seem to be stuck in this low growth funk, if you will, of one and, and decimal points, which is which is I find hard to fathom. At the end of the day, we're just moving around the deck chairs here and we're not really addressing real issues. And we spoke earlier a bit about structural reform. Yeah. We're tired of the, and you named a few, the sort of state-owned junkies queuing up for their, their, their sort of uh, budgetary fix. We can't have that and, uh, on an ongoing basis. And clearly, you know, money's been, been moved from, from different departments and reprioritized, et cetera. But at the end of the day, is that without some, some severe structural reform, and also managerial reform within these companies as well as government departments, I'm afraid, 
uh, we ain't really going to be going anywhere. Yeah, he also then goes on to say, but we cannot allow our recent fiscal weakness and the pandemic to turn into a sovereign debt crisis. Are we not already there or am I being alarmist? Look, we've been talking about fiscal cliff for a long time. And one country he mentioned, which he spoke about this a few weeks ago, which, which really does concern me at no end, is Argentina. Mm. Now, Argentina, you know, there's been analogies of, you know, which country do we resemble? Um, clearly, Argentina is a country which is which has uh, had bailout after bailout, IMF restructuring, but populist politics and leftist ideology and just generally socialist economics prevents the country from moving forward after decades and decades of more of the same. And I'm afraid, you know, at what point does a country say enough is enough and we need to move beyond this? And as, as soon as the as the state, the government continues to pander arguably to, to uh, the ideological interest, I'm, I'm afraid that is our destination. So, yes, we are on the cusp of a, of, a, of a debt crisis. Managing the debt is concerning. You mentioned the, the borrowing on a daily basis. And uh, as I said, we talk about a developmental state previously. Now we talk about a capable state. I'd like to talk about an agile state, you know, and, and something which I was in, uh, when was it, 1997, 98, I was in Singapore for a while at the height of the Asian financial crisis. Mm. The Singapore government, which we often laud, um, looked at actually 15% pay cut above, uh, across the board for every single public sector employee, prime minister to post office worker, immediately to reposition the economy for greater uh, for more agility and more efficiency. Mm. Now, what I've been observing in this last, since March, effectively, since lockdown and various stages thereof, the vast bulk of the pain in our country has been felt by, by people in the business, people in the real economy. Everyone has taken a haircut, people not, not, having, not having income, and it, it's a severe pain. Is that pain being felt in the public sector? Clearly not when a labor union still talks about a pay increase of 8%. And that really wasn't really addressed in this, in this, in this budget speech update. So I think, you know, if we're all in this together, public sector needs to come to the party beyond just moving the money around. Yeah, in trying to put that money around, and you know, you make such a good point with regards to that that pay cut issue, though. We haven't nailed ourselves to any figure per se. I mean, uh, the the... The minister's notes how it's been increasing by around 7.2% over the last five years. And over the next five years, it has to decrease by much, much lower. What exactly does that mean? Are we perhaps being non-committal here, which isn't really helpful, is it? It's non-committal. We don't want to upset other people in the tripartite alliance, perhaps. That, that, that I'm afraid, is, is leadership is about, everybody you know, leadership is about making tough decisions at difficult mm. times. And I'm afraid, you know, it's, it, it's, he spoke also about a, a it's almost consensus budget. You know, if, if a plane is hitting turbulence, if the plane has technical problems and the plane is going down in flames, arguably, what does a pilot do? The pilot rectifies the situation, gains control of the plane and continues to fly. He or she, the pilot, the leader, does not seek consensus amongst every passenger as to what yep. to do. That's why he or she is the pilot. And I'm afraid that's where we are. So I need to see, we need to see great leadership. Not about, it's not about consensus seeking before decision is made. It's about making active decisions, informed decisions, based again on that, that phrase we used earlier, pragmatism, not ideological ones, not pandering to, to vested political interests, particularly those of an ideological bent, um, and getting the country corrected. I think, I think as most honest and, uh, and, uh, sort of, you know, patriotic South African citizens, that's what we want to see happen. Yeah, yeah, it certainly is what we want to see happen. It feels as though the pilot of this plane is steering us down and still trying to comfort us at the same time. Martin Davies, appreciate the time. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. From Deloitte, they're giving us a rundown perhaps on just where we will get things right, if we even can. So, so difficult. Now, the Treasurer General at the Black Business Council is hopefully going to uh, be able to join us as well very soon. Uh, and we'll hopefully get into conversation with Bunolo Ramokele as well uh, with regards to this medium-term budget. Just 
Uh, a rundown very quickly as well with some more information uh, with regards to the medium-term budget policy statement being put out by uh, the uh, finance minister there. The medium-term fiscal uh, strategy tries to narrow the main budget primary deficit from an expected uh, 266 billion rand uh, in the next financial period to around 84 uh, billion rand then that's a deficit so they're trying to narrow that down the primary deficit to 2023 2024 and then try to achieve that surplus then by the 2025 2026 year so we'll see whether we can get that right the treasurer general at the black business council bonolo ramohele does join us now as well via video link uh, bonolo thank you so much for the time appreciate it did that spark enough confidence for you do you feel as though we are headed to some sort of prosperity as the minister put it uh, afternoon, Arabil, and afternoon to the viewers at home. Um, look, uh, we are not uh, naive to the realities on the ground and the realities that the country faces in that uh, South Africa effectively uh, has hit uh, a bit of a brick wall when it comes to finances, and we need to find creative ways and make hard choices um, in how we get our ourselves out of this quagmire and set the country on a, a, a you know a, a positive uh, path uh, for generations to come. So one, as the Black Business Council, uh, we we welcome the the, the minister's uh, posture and stance on, uh, on 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 debt stabilisation, because uh, if you look at it, Arabile, we we're already spending uh, uh, roughly 200 billion uh, rands on debt service costs. Uh, that's not the debt that we're raising. Those were the costs that we're paying, the interest that we're paying, instead of that money going uh, towards health, education, and so forth. So given the, the pandemic that we have been facing, uh, we have now been forced to borrow more, and those debt service costs are going to skyrocket. So we appreciate that the minister wants to stabilize that um, over yeah. the medium uh, term. Um, but um, one of the things that uh, we are especially concerned about uh, is the continuous uh, uh, pouring of funds uh, into SAA, and we're not actually seeing uh, the strategic uh, nature of that uh, particular uh, investment. Uh, we welcome uh, the investment, I mean, the, the, the money that has been put into, that is going to be put into the land bank, uh, because unfortunately, uh, you and I have to eat uh, until uh, Jesus Christ comes back, and we do need to stabilize uh, the agricultural sector. Uh, that is very much um, uh, welcome on, on, on our end. Yeah. Uh, Bunolo, the minister spoke quite vehemently about how, um, you know, private sector ha has made sacrifices and even negotiated salary cuts in order to keep businesses afloat. I mean, a whole host of your members would have done a similar thing with some even uh, forcibly having to retrench some workers too, uh, still to try and keep that business afloat so we can still boost the economy. What is your sense then of, you know, being non-committal, if I can call it that, by the finance minister, on the public wage bill and that not necessarily decreasing by a specific or specified amount. Does that perhaps worry you at all as the Black, as the black Business Council? Um, look, uh, you, you, you are indeed uh, correct and the minister is correct. If you look at uh, the latest uh, Statistics South Africa uh, report, you'll find that uh, liquidations have been up uh, by uh, roughly 27% in the last quarter. That was measured, and uh, job losses were were uh, roughly around 648,000. Uh, uh, that is not even uh, people who have lost uh, income or, or, or reduced income. Those are people who are effectively uh, without a job in the last quarter alone, um, and those were largely uh, because of uh, you know the private sector having to make uh, hard choices, and some businesses have to to save jobs uh, have had to cut uh, you know salaries, and so forth. And uh, the, the issue with the minister, we, we understand uh, where, why he cannot say certain things, because you will appreciate that, uh, Arabile, these, these issues um, have a tendency to, to be political. Uh, you do need to take into account uh, the, 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 the views of the labor uh, unions. And you do need to take uh, the views of uh, even other uh, stakeholders. So you cannot just, uh, you know, willy-nilly say it because uh, it can create uh, problems when you have to get into the, the actual negotiation. So what the minister has done, uh, you know, by actually putting this into the public domain, 
um, he's effectively setting the tone to ensure that uh, that those discussions actually happen. Yeah. But we do need to to to, to factor in another issue, uh, Arabile, in that. Uh, you know, the, the public sector, and as much as it is bloated, the public sector actually needs to be increased because uh, you and I know that when you go to a public hospital, there aren't enough nurses. That's a public sector, uh, you know, yeah, workforce that yeah. needs to be, uh, you know, looked into and increased. But the issue of the pay, you know, you need to be sensitive how you, 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 you engage in it. You know, we can't be, uh, you know, naive and think that, uh, you know, we work in a dictatorial state whereby government can do as they please. We do need to enter those negotiations with the union, take them into confidence, and ensure that, uh, you know, we stabilize our spending, because our spending is skyrocketing, and majority of what we are going to be spending on over the medium term happens to be uh, employee costs. Um, sure, so we're now sure. forced uh, to borrow in yeah. order to be able to invest into the CAPEX that but, actually keeps the economy growing. Yeah, but no, no, if, if I may then play devil's advocate here was there lip service being given to us when the minister said we're going to make things or make it easier to do business remove the needlessly complex red tape that increases the cost of doing business we've continuously heard this but it doesn't seem to get done um that, that one uh, i think that uh, maybe uh, the minister's speech writers uh, had uh, run out of, uh, you know, <laughs> they, they needed to complete their speech within a set amount of words. We've all done it in varsity, uh, where you needed to have a set amount of words and you just slot in a few things. But uh, to be more serious, um, look, that, that, that is something that will need multiple departments, uh, especially uh, when it comes to the DTI and the small business uh, development. Yeah. And also even other departments that need, for example, issues such as when you are doing a construction project, um, you know, municipalities are a major uh, hurdle that yep. uh, sometimes yep. bring projects to a standstill. Sure. Because you've got councillors who are going to sit on approval for years on end, uh, you know, before a, a construction of, of, of projects uh, get, 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 uh, gets sure. going. Sure. So we think that um, the, the, this needs a multiplicity of voices and a multiplicity of efforts. Yeah. And uh, we think that uh, there is a need um, to, to, to have the DTI effectively cracking the whip. I think the more relevant uh, department to be able to do this yeah. would be uh, the DTI, small business uh, development. And Hopefully. on an infrastructure uh, component, yeah. uh, the newly created infrastructure South Africa would need to actually crack the whip on majority of the projects that are deemed to yep, be key yep. for economic growth and not only the ones that have been gazetted uh, by, uh, by cabinet. Perhaps not enough cracking of the whip being done at present. Bonolo Ramukhele, the Treasury General, uh, General there of the Black Business Council, joining us and helping us unpack this market picture. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, hopefully then we can cross over as well to the Chief Economist at NetBank, Nikki Weimar, joining us uh, via video link as well. Nikki, the growth projections for South Africa here, quite difficult. The proposed consolidated spending, 6.2 trillion rand over the 2021 medium-term expenditure framework, uh, 1.2 trillion going to learning and culture. Uh, so difficult to put forward these numbers as well then our revised framework puts us on course to stabilize the ratio of debt to gdp at around 95 percent within the next five years the stock of gross debt rising roughly uh, from 4 trillion rand this year to around 5.5 trillion in the 2023-2024 uh, fiscal year so 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 difficult and what do we do now? 95%, Nikki Weimar, uh, Chief Economist then at NetBank, joining us on the line there. 95% of GDP is where our debt ratio will sit uh, within the next five years. This is still going to be very difficult, isn't it? I mean, we just thought 87% was bad. Now we're sitting with 95% at the very least, and that's the optimistic case there. Yes, indeed. Um, I mean, it's dependent firstly on their economic forecast. So, um, you know, that means you've got to kind of contain uh, the the contraction in GDP this year to just over to just below eight percent, and then you have to uh, see the growth uh, return from next year onwards. And this all in the middle, of course, of a pandemic that is still unfolding. Uh, the market's very spooked today. 
um, expecting the re you know the reimposition of um, containment measures, maybe even lockdowns in some of your advanced countries. So, yeah, yeah it's really an uphill battle. It's uh, 2020 has really been a horrid year, to put it mildly. Um, but it's not all COVID-19. COVID-19 has made things a lot worse for us, but we've been on the wrong path for over a decade now. Mm. And we've left it to the point where, you know, we now sit with a mountain of debt um, that we will have to deal with in the years to come. And I suppose it is um, very simply what it means is that government doesn't have a lot of spending power, doesn't have a lot of ammunition. So with the economy in this very uh, big dip, if you like, which I think is putting it mildly more like a, a very deep pit, of despair, um, it will take, uh, you know, I, I think really a, a, a tremendous amount of sacrifice from everybody to get yeah. out of here. I think the right word is crater, really, considering how far down <laughs> it really is. Uh, growth projections of 3.3%. So one, on, one on the moon or Mars? I'm not sure which <laughs> ones are bigger. <laughs> Certainly big holes either way. Look, 2021, 3.3% uh, growth rate, 1.7% in 2022, 1.5% in 2023. It still doesn't bode well, though, does it? It still doesn't send the positive sense that, okay, yeah. we've put in the reforms and we're actually going to get ourselves jolted and back into action. Yeah, on the reforms, I mean, there isn't a tremendous amount of information really on the on the reforms. Yeah. Um, and exactly how they're going to make these ends meet. Because the one thing that they, they make clear is that they've got the same budget deficit, they've got the same... Uh, whether you look at the main budget deficit or uh, the consolidated budget deficit, mm. um, and they, you know, they point out that one of the key reforms they're going to implement there will be to bring uh, down the public sector wage goal, which, as you know, is controversial and currently um, really uh, been taken to the courts. So, how quickly they can progress with that particular. Um, a reprioritization, if you like, is not certain. And they make the point that they will increasingly be um, supporting really fixed investment as opposed to consumption expenditure. Yeah. Um, but where they're going to get the money for that and what they will be cutting um, is not clear. I mean, they do show in their um, expenditure priorities that it will go more towards infrastructure and that there will be some space through the infrastructure fund uh, for growing. But for it to uh, build up to a trillion rand and new fixed investment is difficult to imagine. I'm not sure how that will be done. And it's not really... Um, made very clear mm. uh, in, in this particular mini budget. Um, and then on the actual reforms, you know, even the reconstruction and recovery plan, they're good ideas there. You know, the fact that we are um, going to continue pressing ahead with uh, reforms in the energy sector, that ESCOM is making progress with deregulation um, and restructuring, uh, that, uh, you know, they will be auctioning um, out the, the well, well a point, you know, awarding the tenders um, by the end of this year to release new spectrum or additional mm. spectrum. Those are all good elements. But in South Africa's case, you know, we actually need... Um, quite a significant amount of uncertainties to be resolved. In yeah. other words, yeah. um, how will land reform be implemented? How will the change in the constitution regarding um, expropriation without compensation uh, affect property rights in South Africa? We need clarity on those things. It's already done, so we're not going to go back. But we need to know what are the bounds here. Yeah. Foreign investors need to know that. Those are the people whose money we need to get our economy out of the slump. Yeah. The other thing that no certainty have been provided on is how exactly are they going to change, um, you know, the Resources and Minerals Act. The mining charter is still a controversial issue. So a lot of these disincentives that raise the hurdle rates to investment in South Africa, none of those have actually been cleared up. Mm. Um, and that's really what we need to make progress. Sure. 
Whether we'll even make progress over the next couple of years is perhaps quite difficult to ascertain. Very quickly, uh, government proposes a three-year fiscal consolidation or proposed a three-year fiscal consolidation, but it seems like we're spending everywhere else. Was that contradictory? No, well, if they stick to the plan they've put out, it is in a four, it, it is fiscal consolidation, yes. Um, and, you know, it is going to be very rough for South Africans, I think, and for, for ordinary South African households and the poor middle class that is already, um, you know, taking a tremendous amount of strain in South Africa. Uh, the reality is you're going to have reduced services, um, reduced consumption expenditure, uh, in order really for us to deal with this enormous surge in the budget deficit as a result of COVID, the collapse in tax revenue and the increased spending government had to undertake. Let's let's be honest. I mean, you, uh, government had a responsibility to the most vulnerable in our society um, to yeah. carry them through this very, very difficult time. We've all taken a big hit, but for the poor, it has been that much more uh, severe. It's the difference between not having a meal that day or having something to eat. So yeah. I, I can understand that. I don't have an issue with that. But yeah. the problem is that I think, um, you know, I just think that they're not willing to make some of the more difficult decisions in the labor market around yeah. legislation, yeah. around fighting vested interests in order to truly restore sure. uh, investor confidence. And yeah. that is the bit that concerns me. So it will be fiscal austerity because you will have cuts in services and at the same time you are also going to have higher taxes yeah 100%. and the higher taxes of course <laughs> will also put pressure on household income sure. so so tough i i don't even know where we're going to go to from here nikki appreciate the time though hopefully we'll continue to uh, dissect it as much as possible and chat to you very soon as well nikki weimar chief economist there uh, at uh, nedbank joining us to give some sort of rundown of how difficult the scenario certainly is at present just also i mean some some other aspects have of course come through uh, speaking about a, the employment initiatives which the president had of course spoken through about in his uh, reconstruction and uh, economic recovery plan as well uh, government uh, or national treasury announcing a 12.6 billion rand allocation to that in the in his financial plan one of the issues was a, a provincial equitable share which will be augmented by 7 billion rand in order to try and support jobs at fee paying public schools as well and government subsidized independent schools uh, at the same time there will be 600 million rand which is said to go uh, to employing early child her development and social workers, uh, which is uh, certainly very critical in employment. Uh, it's important, should I say, thought that perhaps money would have actually been taken away from some of these segments, but they're so critical and so important, and indeed more money being plowed into them. Two billion rand is allocated for working for fire, working for water, and working for forests. Um, all those initiatives have certainly needed uh, quite a bit of money as well. The district development model will f uh, fast track infrastructure and general socio-economic development. That is certainly the hope then, of course, uh, by National Treasury. One of the other things that have been uh, a critical part of President Cyril Ramaphosa's uh, plan a little bit earlier on, the 500 billion rand uh, stimulus package that he had hoped would certainly boost South Africa, was the loan guarantee scheme, which hasn't really had much of a big take up there as well and the finance minister even today saying that he's working indeed with the banking associations of southern africa and the south african reserve bank to review that entire process and ensure that take up is increased in some uh, potential way i will continue to say this however about that loan guarantee scheme if you're aiming to stimulate or aiming to pick up or boost south africans offering them loans is not necessarily going to help them in this way yes you offer up cheaper loans but let's remember this you're getting people into more debt here in South Africa. Whether they be a business or anything of that sort, they're still getting themselves into more debt. You may say that because they get a lower interest rate and they only have to pay those loans after a year, that perhaps things are a little bit different. But let's remember, in doing that, they still increase their leverage. And after a year, if their business isn't doing well, they're still going to have to pay you back that money, government. And you're still asking them to stimulate South Africa's economy. How? When they're still going to have to struggle from the long-term effect of this COVID-19 pandemic. I'm not saying we have free money to just offer up. But if we are going to have a stimulus package or a guarantee scheme, the likes of which you're putting out of this 200 billion rand, 
then it may be necessary to reconsider how exactly you put it out, how exactly you put it forward. One, does it have to be in the form of a loan? If not, perhaps we could have thought of other economic factors and other ways to help. Perhaps we could have induced some greater economic factors in trying to build entities and their businesses, forego certain costs at a time when perhaps they can pay them uh, at a later stage and not have to necessarily go backwards uh, and repay some of those as well. So I consider, continue to have had a few issues with that loan guarantee scheme and I'm not necessarily sure it is the best way to stimulate South Africa's economy uh, as we move forward. But again, that is just the personal opinion. Let's continue to perhaps get some more uh, sentiment then out of the main budget deficit as well. 14.6% is perhaps the unchanged figure as a ratio of South Africa's GDP uh, that South Africa's uh, main budget deficit is expected to be at. The figure itself is 707.8 billion rand, which is what we're expecting to continue to have then. Uh, the consolidated deficit as well is also marginally better in rand terms, but unchanged as a proportion of GDP at 15.7%. Saying that they have tried to, at the very least, then broaden their financing strategy to include drawing down on sterilization and foreign currency deposits. Speaking of foreign currency deposits, it means that international investors may look at this and say to themselves, Well, where to from here? Is my money safe? Is my money actually going to come back to me? Uh, considering that things aren't necessarily going in the direction that South Africa had touted, even when it came to that supplementary budget. Yes, there is a changing sphere. Yes, South Africa will now have a uh, contraction in its economic front of around 7.8% according to National Treasury today. But the growth, growth picture of 3.3% getting into next year may not necessarily offer up enough to say to themselves, we'll recoup some, some of those, uh, those losses heading into other years. And of course, even the JSC has unfortunately had quite a large number of losses. The ratings agencies, what do they say? International investors, will they find this uh, enough to perhaps uh, continue continue uh, in South Africa as well. Of course, we are on, uh, uh, what is it now, a, a junk status, that is, according to the three major ratings agencies in the country as well. So that does not bode well for South Africa uh, in a time like this. We are expecting to get more word then from the finance minister. A uh, press briefing is expected to come through then at the top of the hour, which will hopefully hold live for you as well. Do stay with us here on SABC News. We're going to try and bring that for you live here and try to get more word from the uh, finance minister and perhaps get clarity on a few more issues as well. We'll cross on over to that briefing as it starts out in Cape Town. For now, though, let's take a quick break. Back right after this. I got a call from uh, this guy. He said he wanted to compare my insurance. After asking me what car you drive, model and so on, he gave me an offer and that was over 470.
basic entity for South Africa's growth as well. Can we at any point in time begin to build this economy beyond where we currently sit? The fiscal consolidation path certainly hasn't worked thus far. And even though the finance minister has touted it again, it does feel as though we're perhaps spending a little bit too much as well. Yes, perhaps we could spend ourselves out of this situation, but how exactly do we do that? when we don't even have the finances. I mean, the World Bank just a little bit earlier has already made note of how difficult it will be for them to accept South Africa's plea for the two billion US dollars when we perhaps cannot, for one, reduce that wage bill. Two, we cannot use the money itself to try and bail out the state-owned entities which continue to ask for more and more money. So, South Africa's economy is going to need a bit of a tug and a pull. And I say a bit, that might even be an understatement in itself. We need the growth picture for the country to tick a little bit higher. And even though the finance minister has delivered that medium-term budget policy statement, I just wonder just how much positivity there has brought to the market. In terms of the local currency, well, that has gotten a bit of a hit. 16 rand and 9 cents is where the local currency sat against the US dollar yesterday, today, and now sitting at around 16 rand and 40 cents. Perhaps the influence is not necessarily just South African, considering that the European markets have also been absolutely hammered of late. More fears around the increased number of COVID-19 cases and a resurgence of the virus in that part of the world. And it also just means that demand for goods, not just local, but across the world, is certainly going down. A more than 1% weakness as well. In fact, a more than 3% weakness when it comes to the oil price, because demand for that has continued to flounder uh, as well. So things across the globe not doing too well. In fact, the growth picture for the rest of the world is bound to go down. Sub-Saharan Africa is expected to see a contraction in its growth rate of around 3.1%. That's the lowest figure recorded history then when it comes to the uh, growth perspective for the continent. Things are bound to get a whole lot harder from here on in. And South Africa is playing a critical role in that demise, unfortunately. 7.8% contraction for South Africa's economy this year. Only growth picture of 3.3% according to National Treasury going into next year. 1.7% in uh, 2022 and then hopefully 1.5%. That just brings us back to the estimates that we've always seen, that low growth part that South Africa continues to find itself in. Are we in a sovereign debt crisis? The question becomes, well, if we surpass 100% of debt to GDP, then perhaps we will be. Over the next five years, the best case estimate by National Treasury is that we will arrest our debt picture to sit in and around 95% of GDP. That means we would have wiped out all of our services and offers that we have as a country by 95% in around five years time. The difficulty there is where do you pick up from when you have an unemployment rate that currently sits at 42% anyway of South Africa's country. That's the expanded definition nonetheless anyway, which includes people who have ultimately given up looking out for work then as well. All right, it certainly is difficult uh, to get this picture going, but that's what the current picture looks like. We have a media briefing that we expected to get out of the National Treasury. That's touted to have started already, but it hasn't as yet. We will cross live to it then for you as and when it begins because things are certainly uh, difficult on that front. Now, we continue to get perhaps a more uh, word out of this medium-term budget policy statement. And as I've made note of, of course, there are many facets uh, to it here. Uh, and just the debates around what exactly it is we're going to uh, do for South Africa's small businesses has been a big issue. An uncontrolled increase in borrowing costs would harm small businesses. And I mean, if that certainly is the notion by government and it's put out in the medium-term budget policy statement by the finance minister, then perhaps the loan guarantee scheme again isn't necessarily the right way to go about things. But nonetheless, this is what the minister makes note of. He says an uncontrolled increase in borrowing costs would harm small businesses ordinary South Africans, as well as the poor, the most. So it is very critical that indeed government does not increase its debt any further. On current trends, more of our taxes are being transferred to bondholders rather than to critical services for our people. 
And yet, we say to ourselves, we're going to grow this economy. There are green shoots. Where? When you perhaps aren't even able to spend the money where you should be spending it. That is on those critical services for our people. Uh, the cabinet has remained resolute and will walk through the narrow gates towards fiscal sustainability. Man, if I could uh, perhaps get a billion rand for every time I've heard that word from a finance minister in my time covering the uh, medium-term budget policy statement and the budget itself, I think I could certainly fund some parts of the country's expenditure as well for some time to come. Before today, the economy languished in what is a trap of paralysis. He says that before today, the country was in a trap of economic paralysis. Perhaps the question is, when did we get out of it? And how would we have gotten out of it? Considering that even the 500 billion rand stimulus package has, hasn't even been used to its uh, half capacity. Forget full capacity at this stage and this point in time. And if you have uh, the, uh, the main budget deficit still at 14.6% of GDP, it does mean that you are still struggling to grow South Africa's economy. You still haven't been able to arrest the growth or the debt picture in which you currently sit in. So it becomes uh, very critical to try and fix that right now. All right, some of the other things that we have spoken about is the infrastructure development, of course, that government continues to try and put forward as well uh, for South Africa's economy. Uh, very difficult uh, to ensure that it actually comes through uh, sufficiently and that it's actually seen, as most consumers may ask themselves, where exactly will that money come from? All right, some of the other things that uh, the finance minister has said uh, are needed is to create stable and predictable policies uh, as we rebuild, there must be a universal understanding of the policy trajectory. We must ensure our ingenuity and adapt uh, after the ravages of the pandemic and embrace sustainable future and work towards a green and just transition. The future of work is now different in post-COVID-19 world. The public service must adapt to the new world after the pandemic. The crisis highlighting and unfortunately widening some of the inequalities in the country we must continue to protect the vulnerable is perhaps the note there as well. Well, at such elevated real interest rates, according to the finance minister, every additional rand gets less than a rand of GDP, meaning that every rand that we make or every rand that we hopefully uh, are trying to, to, to put into the economy doesn't actually even give us a rand back. And yet we're supposed to get more in terms of the money in South Africa. It may even subtract GDP, leaving us poorer and more indebted than before. As we borrow more money, we pay even more. So why then would we continue to borrow more money at this stage? We also have not been spending on infrastructure, which creates the kind of long-term growth that South Africa may indeed need. We act to instill confidence amongst discouraged workers, businesses bruised by the lockdown and facing uncertainty, farmers and farm workers and who produce food as well for the country. The difficulties are unbelievable. Where to will our country get things right when all of these facets, when all of these parts of the business aren't working correctly? What do we do from here? Let's take a short ad break. We're back right after this, and hopefully at that point, the medium-term budget policy statements, uh, press briefing then by the finance minister, Tito Mboweni, as well as his counterparts, will certainly uh, have begun, we certainly hope, and we'll try to give that to you live here on SABC News. Break after this.
The humdrum of South Africa's central business district there, where the uh, taxis are certainly taking people across this wonderful space of ours as well. In the city centre of Johannesburg, that are uh, those there rather, should I say, are the live visuals then of central business district here in Johannesburg, South Africa. Now, the medium-term budget policy statement by Finance Minister Tito Moeni did continue to try and touch on as many issues as po uh, possible, of course, at a time like this. And trying to get the unions, perhaps, to uh, form part of the discussions has certainly been very difficult as well. How exactly do things come to the fore? How exactly do perhaps the unions themselves play a role in this? Are they accepting of what the finance minister has just put forward. Let's talk now to Kosatu Sizwe Pamela about this and, of course, even some of the other issues, including the funding of SAA. Mr. Pamela, thank you so much for the time this afternoon. Thank you uh, for joining us. Uh, your, perhaps your, your sentiments, your thoughts. Uh, the minister speaks about public, uh, public servants and public workers indeed needing to perhaps toe the line when it comes to increases in salary and perhaps even cutting that. Your thoughts? No, look, um, th that issue is out of the question. Firstly, we don't negotiate in Parliament. That was a big mistake right there. Mm. Uh, you will have all the time to announce the outcomes of the PFCPC, um, allow uh, the relevant structures to negotiate. If that is the position of government, take it to PFCPC, allow other parties to engage. And then when you have a position, you can announce. But you, you, we are not members of Parliament. We're not MPs. So... We don't have an opportunity to go and, and debate in Parliament. So yeah. it's out of the question. Until such time that government has tabled its proposal, officially at the PSPC, we will engage. Yeah. But it's not worth talking about it right now because uh, it's wishful thinking on, on his part, uh, but it, it really doesn't affect the process going forward. We are going to go back to PSPC, we'll negotiate. And whatever uh, will be adopted with the outcome of a negotiation, uh, negotiated process. Yeah. Sizwe, you, you'll be the first to admit then that, uh, of course, government has kind of held back in many instances when it comes to the, the final year. Um, of increases for the, the, you know, the deal that it sort of had with uh, public workers as well then. What is the move from this point onwards? And, you know, you say, I, I fully agree with you, and I guess that uh, the, the, the point of perhaps not speaking about it now doesn't make sense when you don't even have a proposal from government. Has government even come to you to say, perhaps can we reorganize things? No. Um, remember, we are still fighting over the government's failure to implement the third leg of the 2018 agreement, Resolution 1 of 2018. So that process is still in court. Uh, once we, we resolve that one, then we will reopen negotiations going forward. But we are unable to negotiate uh, while at the same time government has let us down by failing to implement uh, the previous agreement. So we're still trying to force government to implement uh, uh, the, 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 the last leg of that agreement. And then we'll reopen negotiations, but we're in no position right now uh, to talk to them when they themselves have actually gone back uh, on, on, on the previous contract they signed with the workers. Mm, so, so true. Um, the note then with regards to SAA, they're getting that 10.5 billion rand, so too are some other SOEs in the mix at this point. Um, what do you make of that then, that offering to SAA? Does it perhaps give you a final sense of that is the final uh, amount being given to them, or do you expect there to be more? Well, look, it, it, it's a step in the right direction. Is government honoring uh, an understanding that it added into with the uh, social partners and stakeholders. Uh, it's, it's the right thing that they've done. I mean, as a, an economy and as a country, we do need to have our own aviation industry. COVID-19 has taught us a number of lessons. So, and, and, and it, it, there are also workers behind these headlines, meaning that uh, those workers will be comforted in knowing that something is being done to really uh, resuscitate SAA. But we need now to collectively work together to make sure that the, we don't have the same SAA uh, 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 that led us, all of us, into this arrangement where we, we, we are restarting uh, an airline. It means we need to have honest conversations about how do we put together uh, yeah. SAA yeah. moving forward and what are the do's and don'ts if, if we want uh, uh, all of this to be sustainable. Sure.
All right. Sizwe, thank you so much for the time. Really appreciate it. Unfortunately, we're going to cut our conversation short uh, there because uh, we have started the media briefing then uh, between the finance minister and some of the members of National Treasury and that press briefing after the MTBPS. Sizwe Pamla is the uh, national spokesperson at COSATU. Let's cross live now to the media briefing by the uh, National Treasury then after the MTBPS 2020. In the apportionment of the debt structure of ESCOM. So all of those things, I think, will be dealt with in due course. Uh, but Tepiso might wish to say something here, TJ. Yeah, Tepiso, you are unmuted now. You can come on. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Minister, absolutely right. In the med medium-term budget policy statement of 2019, we outlined the condition precedent that we would require to even entertain any take on of ESCOM's debt. They are currently doing all the things that we've asked. They are making progress. In some areas, it's still a bit slow, but there is very much a clear understanding that the debt belongs to ESCOM, and ESCOM needs to do certain things that reflect that they are concerned about the debt and to the extent that they require help once all those things are done we can have a conversation so it is not the national treasury problem it is an escom problem and we've outlined that that debt is a symptom of many other issues that needs to be resolved at escom i'll leave it there minister thanks yes that, that's where we are on that issue and i think uh, uh, I think the the question that Miriam raises is is partially muddied by this uh, persistent talk about the conversion of um, um, ESCOM debt into equity. People talk all kinds of things. I think it's not advisable for people to start talking about the conversion of ESCOM debt to equity before we know what they actual outcomes of the divisionalization of ESCOM is, and I think people should just hold their horses uh, and don't let us run ahead of the uh, of the horses. It has to be a problem because the cut will be before the horse and it won't move. So there will be a stampede and a crisis there um, and the manger moose, as the Africans say. So let's leave that matter there until such time that uh, they were ready to issue um, the official statements and get out of the speculative uh, mode. Thank you, Mushu. Thank you very much, Minister. We'll go back to Sasha's question. She asked it a little earlier. We're just waiting for Momo to get online. Um, Sasha's from the Daily Maverick. She asked a little earlier um, a question. Please, can you elaborate on the proposed changes to loop structures and exchange controls mentioned in the speech. Thanks, uh, Mashudu. And apologies, I was I was online earlier, but I couldn't unmute, so I could hear everything. But anyway... Put um, on your video uh, so we can be seen. Please, uh, the, there's a request to put on videos when you speak. Thank you. I might not be presentable, DG, but I'll do so. Uh, um, okay, here I am. So what we've done is there is an explanatory note that we've issued, which is on our website, which provides further details. Basically, it says that, firstly, we made lots of announcements, a major announcement on capital flow management uh, on a negative list approach, uh, that there's been progress made on that and on that, one, on that score. Uh, there will be new regulations which will replace the current exchange control manuals and could be done by, by hopefully by budget next year. Secondly, we just make further announcements related to um, uh, inward listing instruments which are in foreign uh, dominated, uh, denominated and which are invested on exchanges in South Africa that those will be deemed to be domestic so we can get more of them. Secondly, if you look at the loop structures, you know, we removing the restrictions. Loops basically refer to when South Africans sort of uh, invest in a vehicle outside and then that 
vehicle invests back into South Africa that was not allowed. So that's been allowed. And we also make it easier for corporates uh, when they want to do foreign borrowing with recourse to South Africa, that it's not we're moving away from a prior approval system to them just conforming towards a framework and reporting requirements for the Saab. We also talk about, if you look at the, the explanatory note, just about further changes to make South Africa a financial center for Africa, that we are in serious discussions with some of the industry associations to make further uh, changes, which will be which hopefully will be done with and will be able to announce in the budget. I should add that uh, you'll see in the note, we also cover a lot of the uh, uh, agreements at NADLAC with, uh, on retirement withdrawals and so on. So you could read that as well. And there's a financial inclusion draft paper. I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you very much, Momo. We will move now to Carol Payton's um, question. She's from the Business Day. Minister, could you please explain what the holdup is with the World Bank loan, which has still not been granted? Well, there are major conversations taking place between the uh, National Treasury and the and the World Bank. Uh, uh, this. If I understand it correctly, and Sepiso might uh, uh, correct me, yeah? this is not a COVID-related um, uh, grant or I mean, a loan, uh, and that's what complicates the issues. So um, conversations are ongoing, and uh, uh, when we reach at a point of agreement, we'll, 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 we'll let you know. But the conversations are going on, um, and. In my view, um, the probability of success is probably less. But nevertheless, we continue pushing for success to occur. Um, I'm very concerned about some of the posture that the World Bank is taking. But uh, we're discussing internally, and we are going to refine our approach and strategy in conversation with the World Bank so that we can have a positive outcome. So for now, please wait until we conclude the conversations. Uh, if they are successful, well, if they are successful, yes, we'll inform you. If they are not successful, we'll still inform you um, at the same time. So I think we should leave it there for now, uh, less in the realm of speculation and wait for the facts to be put before you. Maybe you could focus a little bit on the medium-term budget policy statement. It might, be, it might help. That's why we're here for, not for speculative purposes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. We've got another question from Paul from the PKF. Both in the February budget speech and now again here today, you do not seem to be able to address the seriousness of the public sector wage bill reduction needed. Each time it is afflicted to another minister and there does not seem to be any traction with the NISU reductions. Well, I'm not the minister responsible for public service and administration. Therefore, I can't use their powers. I, I don't have those powers. The powers to reach an agreement with the trade union rests with the Department of the Public Service and Administration. I can't use ZEP for other ministers' powers. I must stay in my lane. Um, and, and that's what I'm doing. I'm staying in my lane. The responsibility um, for negotiating with the unions lies with the Minister of the Department of Public Service and Administration. I can't use up their powers. I'm sorry. Uh, that's all I can tell you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. We'll move to Mfuneko from Reuters. What is the reasoning behind not including contingent liabilities in the debt projections, especially since so many, or especially since many of the guarantees for SOCs have or are likely to materialise soon? DG. Oh, oh I thought Tepiso is taking it, but Tepiso, maybe you can take that. Um, it's straightforward on your side. Thank you. 
thank you, DG. Um, as I understand, the question is asking why we're not adding um, guarantees to the debt because the guarantees are realizing. Um, look, that's not the convention. Um, data is presented in a way that makes sense and that is standard across countries and there's standards that we follow. And uh, across various countries, you will see that the standard is to report that and also show the contingent liabilities separately. Um, and to the extent that you want to add on the guarantees or contingent liabilities to the debt, it's a very straightforward uh, process. You can do that yourself, but we need to be able to show what is the actual debt and what is the actual contingent liabilities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tepiso. Thank you very much, Tepiso. We'll move to Denise Mshlanga. She's from Biz News. Her first question is that, is the government still intent on fighting corruption as it says it is? Why, it, why doesn't it shut down Danel and SAA, sites of rampant corruption? And her second question, you spoke about measures to improve business efficiency, cutting red tape, exactly what is envisaged and uh, changes to labor laws. That's a loaded question. Um, so, changes to labor laws, again, that's the, the lane of the Minister of Employment and Labor. So, I kick for touch there. Um, uh, I'll send it in that direction. I think the, the key issue really that confronts the country, and uh, uh, I suppose Duncan should. Uh, maybe come on board here. The key issue that confronts this country uh, is also a mindset change. You know, we used to boast, boast about the fact that we're one of the richest countries in Africa, blah, 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 and our behavior and our psychology was in that direction. <laughs> I'm sorry, the situation has changed. And so we need a mindset change. We need this, maybe some social workers and psychologists must come and help people to understand the situation is, is different. Uh, your debt to GDP is rising. Your debt servicing costs are high. Uh, you don't have much left for investment, uh, which is critical for growth and so on. Bearing in mind that the bulk of the investment anyway is not going to come from the public sector, but it's going to come from uh, the, the private enterprise. And that the key issue is uh, the set of uh, uh, issues I put in place as being critical to create confidence uh, for people to invest into the future. I think that's very important. So whether you are private enterprise, whether you are a farm worker, mine worker, engineering worker, banking worker, and so on. I mean, they, I'm sure you're all aware that the banks, in particular, uh, uh, are reducing their staff numbers because more and more they are having to use technology. Uh, and therefore, they don't need as many people as they used to do before. They are closing branches because very few people go into branches now. Uh, an increasing number, particularly of the young, younger generation, um, are now uh, using technology to work. So the, the penetration of technology into the world of work is huge. And so it requires a lot of mindset change from all of us. Uh, the days when, uh, you know, you used to walk to the teller all the time and explain your life's problems. This, this are over. You can talk to your bank manager by via um, Zoom or MS Teams or by WhatsApp, whatever it is. The world has changed. Like, look at this press conference. Previously, we'd have been downstairs here in Cape Town in an open auditorium having this press conference. Look what we're doing now. 
were meeting through MS Teams. The world is radically changed. I mean, I uh, when I have to meet with the executive uh, committee at the National Treasury, we no longer huddle together in that horrible uh, boardroom of uh, Dondos to talk. We now huddle together in, in MS Teams or via Zoom, and we still do the same amount of work. Uh, you know, um, I'm able to sign documents before recently when my my gadget began to misbehave. I was able to sign documents instantaneously uh, from my from my uh, IT system sitting in my focus group. I could do work. I do work that is is processed in Pretoria, but I'm in my focus group in my study in my focus group. The world has changed, so all of us need to understand that we have to change. I know I went on and on a bit, but uh, Duncan might wish to say something to answer the question directly. Yes, thanks. Uh, thanks, Minister. Thanks, Mashudu. Um, I hope you can hear me. Just to add to what the minister said, uh, the specific point around the measures to improve business efficiency and cutting red tape. Um, as you'd know, we have made a commitment to improve the ease of doing business and in particular also to improve our, our ranking um, in that index. Uh, and that ranking has a few different components, um, some of which relate to the, the time it takes to start a business and, and permitting issues and so on. Um, and that work is, is certainly ongoing and is led by the Department of Trade and Industry and Competition. Um, and in fact, uh, they have a working group with the World Bank uh, where they work on specific targets that they've set themselves to improve South Africa's ranking on the ease of doing business. Um, one of those areas is around starting a business, and it looks as though there's been some good progress there, uh, in particular the use of the biz portal, uh, the new government portal that is used in order to register new businesses at the CIPC and also allow for the opening of bank accounts. So it's clear that there's been some progress there, um, but, but that work is led by the DTIC in collaboration with the World Bank. Um, and it is really about making sure that businesses can register quickly, can get the permits they need um, in order to, to, to start making a meaningful contribution so that we can unlock private investment in the economy. Thanks. Thank you very much, Duncan, very and, much Minister. Duncan and Minister. We've got a question from Kaifes Hosanna from the Sunday Times. Please elaborate on the plan to introduce tax increases of 40 billion in the next four years, which taxes are likely to increase? DJ. Thanks, Chris. Uh, is Chris on the line? Come in. Uh, but I think Chris is on the line. But maybe just to say, I think the key is with tax, we only make announcements on budget day. So you're going to have to wait till budget day. We talk about, obviously, the revenue that we're going to need. Uh, and we'll be, we, we tend to then look from now till budget day to look at uh, what 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 uh, we will what can be done bear in mind that we did say in this budget that we're also keenly aware of the impact of higher taxes on on growth on one hand on the other hand I think we are looking obviously the, the 40 billion figure is over four years so we're looking at 25 billion over three years um, but we'll take those decisions as and when we come to each budget day in the next three years. Uh, Chris, do you want to add anything? Uh, Chris seems to have gone a war. But uh, Momo, can you talk a little bit about the tax measures that we've taken so far as part of the economic support during the COVID process. Just to remind folks what we did and which was in the speech as well, please. Yes, so during COVID, what we've done is we had lots of deferrals um, on, for example, over the employment tax incentive, we allowed uh, taxpayers to actually hold on to that. So it was like an interest-free loan. We allowed delays on payments of many excise duties and so on. 
um, at the time, and and I think in terms of the take up, I, uh, you know, we, we we're looking at a figure of between thirty to forty billion, which has been taken up. So those were all the COVID measures that were announced in March and April this year. So we are, in a sense, uh, you know, we've given back quite a lot this year. Uh, but obviously, there's revenue needs for next year. And as I said earlier, uh, it's something that we will uh, be looking at over the next three months. Uh, bear in mind, the big taxes we have is personal income tax, uh, corporate income tax, and VAT. Uh, and of course, the smaller ones are excise duties, fuel levies, and so on. Chris may well be muted. I think the problem that we had, Minister, so that's why he can't come on. He is online. That's fine. You Thank you very much, Momo. Chris? Um, oh. Yes, Chris has now been, can now speak. Uh, thanks. I think Momo covered everything. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you very much, Chris. Just a point of clarity, Minister. I think it's a question from the from ENCA, Hardy Jokos. She's saying that um, since you say that the for SAA, it's a, not a bailout. So how much money has been allocated to SAA? She's put it's about four questions. How much to repay debt? How much for the BRP practitioners? And what's the total of new money? That's a piece of, please, uh, can you break down that 10.4 for us, please? Yes, Minister, I can do that. Uh, for the government guaranteed debt um, and interest, we have 6.4 billion rands uh, that we announced at the time of the budget, and that is solely for paying of government guaranteed debt uh, and also the interest. Then there is the business rescue package which then is comprising of payment to staff because they would have to let go of staff. And that, that business rescue plan is actually public. So, so the journalist can also have a look at it. Um, and also some of those amounts would go towards um, assisting some of the subsidiaries so that uh, when SAA, the, or rather the new airline is being put uh, forward, it does not carry through some of the liabilities that um, it was carrying prior. Of the some of the remaining guaranteed debt, there's letter, letters of credit um, and also unflown ticket liabilities that were also guaranteed to the tune of two billion uh, uh, rents. So if you unwind the old SAA, those would also become payable, and they are also included in that 10.5 uh, billion rents. Then to start a new airline, that amount is not included. Um, there is still a process by Department of Public Enterprises, um, also supported by Treasury and um, SAA, uh, looking for a strategic equity partner uh, to come and contribute towards this new air uh, that we've, uh, we've talked about. So that is essentially um, how you then look at the funding that is being provided to SAA, of which the 10.5 is just for the business rescue uh, plan. Thank you, Minister. And also, I wanted to add that uh, this is a bit of politicking on my side. The DA is completely out of order when they said that we capitulated and we didn't stand our ground. Well, we're not standing any ground. There's no capitulation. Uh, the Minister of Finance is part and parcel of the government. And the government has made a decision that uh, we need to support the business rescue practitioners plan. It's a decision of the government. That's why the consequence of that decision is that we have to scramble around to find the 10.5 billion uh, to support the business rescue practitioners plan. No buckling under pressure here or any nonsense like that. Um, I think the DA must do their work first, you know, before they make uh, grandstanding things like that. Um, and I don't take kindly to them referring to uh, state-owned enterprises as zombies. Uh, they're not zombies. 
Um, behavior is zombie-like, maybe themselves. So they must stop this nonsense, you know. Let's have a insult one another. Okay, before I get worked up, let me stop there. Thank you very much, Minister. We've got a question from Miriam Issa. She's from Fenwick. The bill was tabled in Parliament last August, and the President said earlier this year that the plan was on course for implementation. What are the Treasury's thoughts on the cost of the NHI and how it can be incorporated into future budgets? Can I suggest that we stick to the medium-term budget policy statement, please? And we stick to the—this is a press conference for the medium-term budget policy statement. Can we stick to that, please? Thanks. Thank you very much, Minister. Thank you very much, Minister. Thank you very much, Minister. When, when there's another question from Tabo Mugone from the Sunday Times. In terms of the benefits of civil servants, public office bearers, which areas are you targeting with uh, what examples can you give in this regard? He's talking about benefits of uh, public servants and public office bearers. No, no. On, 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 on civil servants, I think I've answered the question that the conversations are taking place, being led by uh, the Minister of the Department of Public Service and Administration. So let's leave it there. So we come out of the realm of speculation and causing trouble where it's not necessary. Um, as far as the, the, the public representatives are concerned, their terms and conditions are normally determined by a commission for the remuneration of public representatives. When that commission sits, I, if requested, will make a submission about why I think consideration should be given to the reduction in the compensation for uh, public representatives um, um, going forward. Because the compensation that they're currently receiving is a pre-COVID uh, compensation. The situation has changed. Therefore, we must change with the situation. But if I'm invited to make representations before that commission, I'll do that. But I think my submission is that political decisions need to be taken by the uh, leadership, uh, by the political parties themselves, and also by the uh, representatives in the different forums uh, in parliament, uh, national parliament, NCOP, provincial legislatures, and the uh, city council, uh, city councils in the chambers. So there's a long political process, but I think that the situation failure to understand that will continue thinking the same way or because once for example uh, the compensations are reduced it means that instead of going to shop I don't know in something you now go and shop in Eastgate you know and the prices in something will begin to react to the fact that uh, the less and less people coming to shop in something they're going to East Gates. And so the economics of balancing out they will come into the picture. So, uh, but I think you, you notice that in, in the speech we say consideration should be given. We're not saying this is what is going to happen. We're saying consideration. Consideration means let's debate, let's discuss, let's come to an agreement about these issues. Already in the private sector, there are reductions in compensation. Uh, globally, many companies are also beginning to reduce compensation. And those of us who have got security of employment at least should join in the conversation uh, about what to do about our own compensation. I know it's very difficult to, uh, to ask people to discuss their own uh, compensation situation, but we have to talk about these things. Otherwise, you can't say when you are facing a debt-to-GDP ratio 
of 95%, you say you'll continue in the same way you have been doing things. You're going to have a fiscal crisis, and I'm warning you, I'm warning you, you're going to, I'm using Bishop Tutu's words, that's Bishop Tutu's words, I'm warning you. If you continue in this direction, you are headed for crisis. I'm warning you. Thank you very much, Minister. In keeping with that, we've got a question from Denise Mplanga. She's from Abyss News. She's asking, do you think there is enough in this budget to ensure that we can avoid a financial crisis in South Africa? Earlier this year, you spoke about the risks being high, about that of the sovereign debt crisis. Uh, Edgar, can I ask Edgar DG to take that question? Edgar can come on, but let me let me let me just say yes. We we are saying that, and we are signaling that, and we are giving examples of at least uh, two countries um, whereby we're saying it happened when when they did not take 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 uh, uh, their debt situation seriously, because when we you know experience the debt default, uh, it's going to be challenging. It's going to be dire. So I think what we are saying, and I think the warning that the minister is saying is giving, is that when, 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 when we can still see, when it's still dark, if you look, at, think about that quotation in the Bible, when there's still light, and we can still see, let's walk the right path, so that when it's dark, we 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 can stop and do other things, or sleep, or relax, and again, when there is light, we can move. So I think the analogy there is simply that, at this point in time. We can, we can, we can, you know, finalize our economic reconstruction and structural program, move with those structural reforms, um, address our debt situation, uh, embark on a fiscal consolidation agenda, which is which is responsible, so that we are able to claw back, um, and 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 we are able to to actually focus on supporting productive sectors of the economy, um, in that way. That's the light that we can see at this point in time. But yes, if, if we don't see it, we, we are simply going to get into trouble. So I think the point that you are making, Minister, and that you are, the question that you were asking earlier on is that we are aware. We are aware of things that we should not be doing. We should, and we know we have to close down uh, public entities that are not sustainable, state-owned companies that are not performing, that are not core. We have to close them down or sell them, and 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 only those that can can boost the economy, uh, we, we should be able to support. So there are many things that we know we have to do in order not to get into into the trouble that that we we tried to demonstrate today. That if we're not careful, we'll be in trouble. Edgar, do you want to come in and maybe add? Thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, DG. I think to some extent you've covered me. Let me just say that. Um, yeah, we do uh, believe and are convinced that this plan can work. Its two components are um, reducing the, um, the size of the primary deficit over the MTF and beyond, and closing it ultimately in the year 25-26. And secondly, um, a shifting in the composition of expenditure from uh, consumption, specifically reduction in the public sector wage costs uh, through what is effectively a wage freeze um, and shifting uh, that towards um, capital payments which are growth friendly, resulting in capital payments that rise by 7.8%. Um, um, growth is going to be critical, as the DG was saying. And so if we can increase the size of nominal GDP, the denominator, um, through uh, reform efforts, and we do not return to the long-run averages previous the crisis, uh, we will definitely be able to um, achieve um, a primary surplus in 25-26, and with it, a stabilization um, of the levels of debt. And um, finally, it's, of course, <clears throat> going to be important at the same time um, to start arresting the debt burden arising from SOCs. But this plan definitely um, can work 
um, including because it reduces the interest costs uh, related to government debt and therefore uh, overall interest costs in the economy um, as uh, we go forward. So the answer is yes, this plan definitely can work. And we're confident in that regard. Thank you. Thank you very much, DG Minister and Edgar. Minister Edgar. There's Minister. another question here. It's from Lucano. How does the minister assess the chance of further credit downgrades for South Africa, given that there's more fiscal slippage, even compared to June's budget? Given the ongoing argument over wages, do you think investors will attach much credibility to the new fiscal plan? Well, I, I start from the point of view that uh, um, we're doing whatever, whatever we can in a very difficult situation. Um, I do not expect any further downgrades, but if those do occur, do not ban me at the stake. We hold conversations with the ratings agencies, and I think, I don't know whether that's tomorrow or Friday, there's another conversation uh, with one of the uh, ratings agencies. We it's explain today. what... what today. Is it today? Yeah, we're meeting Fitch after this meeting. Okay. So we're meeting Fitch after this meeting and we'll explain our situation and this will answer questions and we hear what their response is. We can't hide the numbers we see before us from the ratings agencies. Ours is to engage in robust conversation and debate with them. And, uh, and the numbers are what they are. And they will then go to their committees and make whatever decisions they want. I am not in a position to prejudge their decisions, but I I don't see any reason why they would want to downgrade us, in particular because we're pursuing an active scenario uh, to control the situation as it were close the mouth of the hippopotamus. So I, um, I don't want to use the word I am confident this, I'm confident that, because that's meaningless. But I think that uh, uh, we are going to engage in a robust debate and conversation with them. And depending on what their own assessment is, they will reach at their own conclusions. But uh, we are of the view that uh, there's no need for further downgrades uh, for South Africa at all. There's no need for that. Uh, I think we've been punished enough uh, during a pandemic uh, no harm. And uh, I think yeah, I think the, the, the numbers and the analysis will speak for itself. Yeah. Um, um, it's a piece of to say something. No, Minister, you covered uh, what needed to be covered. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. Thank you very much, Minister. A question from the Daily Maverick, Ray Matlaka. He's asking, in 2020, in 2019-2020, the government expects compensation of public servants to be about 41% of tax revenue. What is the percentage for the 2020-21? The answer is rolling. The answer is rolling. Heather? Hey, Roy, it's about... It's about 57% this year, Minister, but that's because, uh, in partly because of the dramatic decline in uh, revenue because of COVID. Um, it'll go back down again next year. But it is this year elevated at about 57% of revenue. Thanks. Okay, there you are. 
Thank you very much, Edgar. We are definitely coming to the end of the press conference. I think there's just a few more questions that we'll need to deal with, and we'll be we're just wrapping up now. And um, there's a question, last question from Miriam Issa. Does National Treasury plan to continue auctioning 6.6 .6 billion rand of government bonds on a weekly basis through this year and next year? Thank you, Mashudi. Yes, yes, Minister. The the straightforward answer is uh, yes for this year. For next year, we will provide um, guidance um, at the end of uh, this fiscal year. It is difficult to commit to next year as it stands. Um, and I know the question, the other question around there, which I've seen here, is you know, given that government is ahead of funding, uh, why were the auction levels not reduced? Well, obviously, we look at this in a holistic manner, and we're not just looking at what one instrument. So if one instrument is doing well and others are not doing well, um, the overfunding in other instruments will compensate uh, for the underperformance in, in other areas. And then um, another question um, that has come through is around whether government will be accessing the international bond markets in the medium term. For this year, we are not planning to do so. We've given an indication of where the 7.3 um, billion US dollars would come from. But going forward, the funds that we received this year from international finance institutions, we do not foresee those funds coming through. Um, they were reacting to a shock. Um, and once that shock, they believe it's being dealt with, we'll certainly have to, to go back to, to the international capital markets and raise uh, bonds like we've been doing in the past. But having said that, it's a balance of market conditions uh, and also um, our requirements and the, to some extent the kind of buffers that we have and all that interplay give us a sense of what the best strategy is at the time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tepiso. Um, colleagues, we have come to the end of the media briefing. I'd like to suggest to colleagues if there are any other questions that they would like to pose um, to officials of National Treasury or the Ministry, please send them through to our media desk and we'll have those questions answered for you. So I'd like to thank our panelists who joined us this afternoon. That is the Minister of Finance, Mr. Tito Mboweni, Deputy Minister of Finance, Dr. David Masondo, the, Dep the Director General of National Treasury, Dr. Um, Mr. Dondo Mukajane, Governor of the South African Reserve Bank, Mr. Lisicha Khanyaho, and the Commissioner of SARS, Mr. Edward Kisfreter. And I'd also like to thank all the National Treasury officials who assisted with answering all the questions on this call this afternoon. I'd like to say thank you once again for joining us for the post-MTBPS media briefing. Good evening. Thank you. All right, that uh, brings the time now to four minutes past uh, 5 p.m. You only get an hour of uh, SA Today with uh, me, Flo Ladwaba. So that was the medium-term budget policy statement uh, briefing. Questions uh, from the media, they're being answered by the panelists, including, of course, the finance uh, minister himself. And that's, of course, coming on the back of uh, the medium-term budget uh, policy statement that was uh, delivered by uh, the minister. We've got a lot of reaction uh, from uh, business, from labor, as well as uh, political reaction. Action, a lot of talk about uh, the SOEs, and no doubt there will continue to be talk about the 10.5 billion rand that has been uh, that will be allocated to SAA to implement its uh, business rescue plan. All right, we're going to take a short break for now. News after this.
your TV works hard for you. Treat it right. Pay your business TV license today. In the trenches of business, don't lose sight of the bigger picture. With NetBank systems integration and electronic banking solutions, you can minimize risk, increase efficiencies, and stay on top of your cash flow. To guide your growth, search NetBank Bigger Picture Business Banking. Another day begins. While we do our part at home and head out to the world to rebuild our community. In these uncertain times, Ubank celebrates you and is here to support you as you bravely show up to build a better tomorrow. Thank you. We salute you. Ubank, growing with you. Did you know that as a Valor TV license holder, you can now win your share of half a million rand in daily prizes? Yes, you only have to renew or pay your domestic TV license. Then dial star 120 star 45887 hash or visit tvlicgames.co.za and take a chance at our Wheel of Fortune Spin and Win or Scratch Pad. Enter to win award-winning giveaways such as airtime, shopping vouchers and household appliances. Dial star 120 star 45887 hash or visit tvlicgames.co.za to enter now. Terms and conditions apply. USSD, 20 cents per 20 seconds, 1 rand 50 per entry. T's and C's apply. TV licenses, making more content possible every day. Hashtag made possible by you. Watching SA Today here on uh, SABC News. Thanks for being with us. Uh, the Special Investigating Unit says it's going after more than 6,000 government officials who unduly benefited from the Unemployment Insurance Fund's uh, temporary relief scheme. Briefing Parliament's uh, watchdog, the Standing Committee on Public Accounts, uh, the SIU, said that these government employees benefited from over 41 million rand in compensation. Six thousand one hundred and forty government employees all received unemployment insurance money while still employed. Other beneficiaries were either underage, dead, or in prison. Seven DCS inmates were identified to be claiming from the relief fund to a total of forty thousand six hundred and fifty-seven rand and ninety-three cents. Then we had deceased individuals who were paid TERS benefits totaling to four hundred and forty-one thousand. 144 rand and 34 cents, which represents 68 deceased beneficiaries making use of 72 bank accounts. 59 officials who benefited unduly are from the National Defence Force. There should be dismissals. Uh, we cannot have a situation whereby people who continue to be on the payroll uh, of the state uh, then loot the state. These culprits must be brought to book. We're not going to leave any stone unturned in getting to the bottom of this. We cannot have, this is no longer about politics and corruption. These are civil servants. The country and the nation, we need to stand up and put an end to this. Five companies were